It's now 7 o'clock, and I'm reconvening to open session and calling to order the regular Board of Education meeting for Indian Prairie School District 204 on Monday, June 10th, 2019. Jackie, will you please call the roll? Mr. Krubus? Mr. Rasak? Here. Ms. Peel? Here. Mr. Rising? Here. Ms. Deming? Here. Ms. Grover? Here. Ms. Donahue? Having four people present and one by phone, we do have a quorum. Mark, will you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have a public hearing today that needs to start at 7.05, so there might be some time we're waiting for 7.05, but I must start that by state statute at 7.05. We do have some time for some board salutes, and I'm gonna ask Mr. Rising to start. Absolutely, the board salutes District 204 Special Olympic athletes who participated in the Special Olympic Summer Games held this past weekend at Illinois State University. Congratulations to the four by 50 meter swim relay state champions, uh, Sophie Boyle, Ryan He, Tim Gibbis, Spencer Howe, and the students who captured silver medal in the four by 25 meter yard freestyle relay, Tyler Leahy, uh, Michael Mueller, Ryan Gronowski, and Andy Anaya. Each of these af athletes earned gold medals in their regional event to qualify for the state games. Congratulations to all our Special Olympic athletes and coaches. Thank you, Mark. And Ms. Peel. Okay, the board salutes 12 District 204 high school seniors who were recently awarded our, the 2019 National Merit Scholarship financed by U.S. colleges and universities. We had scholarship winners from each of our two, District 204 high schools. Officials of each sponsor college selected their scholarship winners from among the finalists in the 2019 National Merit Scholarship Program who plan to attend their institution. These awards provide between $500 and $2,000 annually for up to four years of undergraduate study at the institution financing the scholarship. We congratulate all our National Merit Scholarship winners. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, we do. <laughs> and it's... You're back. It's 7.03, and there's not really an agenda item that we can accomplish in two minutes, so I'm sorry for this, but we will have two minutes of uncomfortable silence. <laughs> <laughs> to play the Jeopardy music. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody see the final Jeopardy where the John Smith, no? James guy. I thought it was John, no? James. Uh, James. Yeah. I, I don't know how I went no. It was in the paper every single day. No? <laughs> <laughs> One minute. Time is now 7.05. I call the public hearing to order. Public hearing today is for the application for a waiver or modification 
of the mandates of school code section 105 ILCS 5 10 17. Um, Ron, do you want to clear all that up for us? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, good evening, board members. Tonight's public hearing is regarding a waiver of a school code mandate related to the publishing of the district's annual statement of affairs. The school code requires that a statement of affairs of the district be published in the newspaper of general circulation prior to December 1st and a certified copy of the statement filed with the Region Office of Education no later than the 15th of December of each year. For proposed waivers of school code mandates, they must be based upon meeting the intent of the rule or mandate in a more effective, efficient, or economical manner. The information contained in the Statement of Affairs is available on the District's Business Office website in parts of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR, in the School Report Card, in the Annual Audit Report of the District Financial Records, and also available through the Freedom of Information Act. Tonight, we're looking to not need to post this information in the newspaper and save the District upwards of $3,000. To comply with this waiver, we'll make this report available when requested, available in the district central office, as well as being published on the district website. The public will also become aware of this availability through, of the report through the district's community newsletter. There are multiple requirements to request a waiver, with ISBE including required notices to the public, each bargain unit group leadership, and state legislators. Each requirement has been completed leading up to tonight's hearing. Tonight's hearing is the final step before submitting the waiver application to the Illinois State Board of Education for approval. The waiver we're seeking is for five years starting with the 1920 school year and would end the 23-24 school year. Thank you. Any questions from board members? Hearing none, we go to the public comment on the proposed waiver or modification. No one has signed up for public comment. So I assume that no one will be speaking to this uh, request for waiver and modification. Hearing no public comment, I need a motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion to close the public meeting. Second. I have a motion and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Jackie, can you call the roll? Mr. Rising. I should say that was the public hearing, not meeting. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Rising? Aye. Aye. Ms. Peel? Aye. Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Grover? Yes. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Motion passes. I now need to move to re the recommended action, which is. I need a motion that the Board of Education approve the application for the waiver and modification of the mandates of the school code section 105 ILCS. I could have done that without you repeating it. Uh, I'll make a motion that the Board of Education uh, approve the application for the waiver modification of the mandates of the school code section 105 of the Code Code Statute 510-17 as presented. There is a motion a second. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Jackie, please call the roll. Mr. Rising. Aye. Ms. Peel? Aye. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Grover? Yes. Motion passes. Now I get to do bittersweet stuff. <laughs> I've worked, uh, right now we're going to honor two of our administrators who are retiring. Um, it's bittersweet for me because I worked with both of these uh, fine people as co and they served as colleagues. Um, it's bittersweet because they're great administrators. <laughs> so it's going to be a loss for our district that they're leaving and retiring. I think they're looking forward to retirement, <laughs> however. And so with that, I'm going to ask Lena Guerri to please come up. stand next to me for a minute here 
So the Indian Prairie School District 204 has a proclamation and it states, whereas Lena Guerrero has devoted the past 32 years of her career working with students in Indian Prairie School District 204, serving as a teacher, student service coordinator, and principal. And whereas Ms. Guerrero be began her career working <coughs> in the parochial school system in Cicero, prior to coming to Indian Prairie District 204, and whereas Ms. Guerrero started as a fourth grade teacher at Brookdale Elementary School in 1987, then transferred to Kendall Elementary School where she served as student service coordinator for 13 years. Since 2007, she has served as principal of Kendall Elementary School and whereas Ms. Guerrero has been a favorite of students, staff, administrators, and parents due to her warmth, enthusiasm, dedication, joyful spirit, and infectious smile, and whereas Ms. Guerrero has modeled hard work, continuous learning, and dedication to each and every student, and has inspired several of her students to become teachers themselves, many of whom now teach in District 204, good work. <laughs> now, therefore, be it proclaimed that District 204 Board of Education, Administration, and Community honor Ms. Guerrero's dedication and devotion to students, teachers, and parents of our community by creating a caring environment which always places children first. We are immensely grateful for all that she has done for our students. Although we will miss her kindness, her sense of humor, and her commitment to District 204, we wish her the best in her future endeavors. Congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Board of Education. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, work in District 204. Um, yes, that many years ago, I came out for my first interview when the central office was located on Route 59 in 34 uh, next to an off-track uh, off betting shop. And I thought, <laughs> okay, where am I headed? And, and it was um, with uh, Howie Krause and Chuck Seidel that I had the opportunity to begin working in District 204 at Brookdale School. So my entire career, with the exception of two years out of the 35, were within this district. And I'm so grateful. I thank everyone for the opportunity, my relationships, the friendships I've made, um, family relations, student relations will forever be in my memory. Um, and I leave um, just knowing that I've had a blessing this career has been a blessing, not a job. It's been a career, and it has truly been a blessing to serve all of you. And I recognize one of my family is right in the front, the Matusik. So I just I saw you walking through the hallway, and um, so it's so nice to see your faces here. So thank you very much, Board of Education. I am so grateful. And now Steve, come on up. The Indian Prairie School District 204 Proclamation, whereas Steve Severinsen has devoted the past 15 years of his career working with middle school students in Indian Prairie District 204, serving as the principal at Gregory Middle School, and whereas Mr. Severinsen served as science teacher at schools in Wilmington, Piatone, and Kankakee, he then moved to Bradley Middle School in Bradley, Illinois, where he served as assistant principal for two years and went on to serve as principal for 12 years. And whereas Mr. Severinsen was honored with the prestigious Millican Family Foundation National Educator of the Year Award, and whereas Ms. Mr. Severinsen has created an atmosphere of mutual trust and support among his staff, and works diligently and successfully to develop and sustain high morale while sustaining high expectations for the attainment of personal 
school and district goals, and whereas during Mr. Severinson's tenure as principal, Gregory Middle School had received numerous awards, including being recognized by the Illinois State Board of Education for his outstanding efforts in successfully implement, implementing positive behavior intervention and supports at Gregory Middle School and being named four times as an Illinois Horizon Schools to Watch by the Association of Illinois Middle Schools. And whereas under Mr. Severinson's leadership, Gregory Middle School received one of the highest accolades of being named the Blue Ribbon School by the U.S. Department of Education. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that District 204 Board of Education, Administration, and Community honor Mr. Severson's dedication and devotion to the students, teachers, and parents of our community through his enthusiastic approach to continuous improvement, leadership, and staff development. We are incredibly grateful for all that he has done for our students, although we will miss his passion for always inspiring our students to achieve their greatest potential and his unwavering commitment to District 204. We wish him all the best in his future endeavors. Congratulations, Steve. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, wherever I go, it's always been about the students and the people and the parents and um, Howie Krause gave me a chance to come to 204 and, and that whole group and I got to work uh, with Mike and I can tell you about the first time meeting I ever had with Mike. We'll do that later. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is an amazing place to work and you should so all just feel so proud to be part of 204. Uh, it, internationally we're known we're known in the state uh, and I think it, it's always been a sense of pride for me to be able to represent Gregory Middle School and the kids that we have there uh, I wouldn't trade the 850 for any 850 in the country and I think I got the best staff um, in the country as well so um, I want to thank all of you for supporting me and uh, making me a better leader as well so thank you very much I appreciate it It is now time for public comment for non-agenda items. If you are here to speak to an agenda item, that comment will be taken immediately prior to that item. And we do have one of a uh, public comment on the behavior report. 30 minutes is allowed for public comment and each person is limited to three minutes. When addressing the board, we ask that you respect the confidentiality and safety of our students and school district personnel. We also ask that those addressing the board be cognizant that this is an open meeting and is available to all age groups. And as such, ask that you consider who the audience members are this evening and keep comments age appropriate. Public comment represents the voice and the opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from board members during the meeting, but follow-up will be provided by an administrator as appropriate. Our First speaker is Lynn Matusek. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you for let me, letting me speak to you all tonight. Um, I would like to talk to you about our son, Sam. He has been in the district since age three, enrolled in the special ed program and has had a one-on-one -on -one nurse from day one due to his medical needs. He is now 16 and going into his junior year at Niqua. We were notified on June 7th of this year that the district is changing Sam's one-on-one -on -one nurse. His current nurse has been with Sam for the last six years. He has had about four nurses in total since he began school. We rely on his nurse to be an extension of the care we give him at home. We trust Sam's current nurse with our son and know that his medical needs will be met and he will be well cared for with dignity. Um, we do not wish this change to happen. 
Um, we have some documented problems when a change in nursing or subnurse has been assigned to our son. The district has been made aware of all issues and has recognized, minimized, and sometimes lied about the events occurring or blamed us. Because of the lack of response or resolution, we were left to bring our issues to the state of Illinois on two occasions. Here are a few examples of what we've experienced and why we're here today. At Neuqua Valley High School, a subnurse failed to read Sam's medical care plan before caring for our son. He was overfed through his feeding tube. This was last year. Um, the district nurse told us that we should have asked the sub when we picked him up from school. Um, um, I'm sorry. Um, the sub nurse bled out his oxygen tank and changed levels on his O2 against his medical care plan. Um, um, the protocol was not followed for calling the school nurse and notifying parents when there was an issue with his medical care. Um, we were told that Nequa Valley was short staffed on on site nursing, that there wasn't a nurse in the building. Sub nurses um, are allowed to continue working after problems with taking care of a child at Nequa Valley arises. The district nurse told us there were no issues with this sub nurse, only to find out that the same nurse our son had that day was given to another child the day before and had some pretty scary issues. At Owen Elementary, a district nurse um, told us that our son did not need oxygen or a nurse when we were at an IEP meeting. Um, a teacher put a band similar than this around my son's mouth and his head um, to keep him from biting his hands without asking us if it was okay. Um, with diapering, they left wet diaper wipes inside my son's diaper to prevent leaking. Um, his daily feeds and records were falsified and changed by the nurse. Um, we had to request a daily log to confirm it to be accurate. Um, at Peterson Elementary, a sub nurse forced Sammy into his wheelchair, causing part of his chair to break, which required a repair on our part. Um, this, is uh, this is what we know and have called out. Um, we called, made calls to the school on June 7th and asked for an email following up on our conversation. We had no email. Called and emailed the superintendent. We haven't heard yet. Um, we called um, some other administrative staff and it finally took until today to get a response. Um, whenever we ask questions about anything related to rules or regulations and district policies regarding our son or special needs kids in general, we don't get any direct answers. Um, we're not sure whose decision it was to change Sammy's nurse or how it would be beneficial for our son. Um, we wanted to know if his team at Nequa Valley was consulted because we are in fact a part of his team. Ms. Matusak, yes. that, that beep was like the three minutes, so I, I need okay. to ask you to like finalize that. Okay, in I'm minute. sorry. And, and like, uh, yes, I know, in a <laughs> sentence or two, please. Basically, um, we've lost trust in the district's nursing administration to reassign a nurse to our son due to what's happened in the past few years. Um, I am not going to put my son in harm's way again without advocating for what is best for him. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Our next speaker is Regina Brent. Welcome, Regina. Thank you. I wish I could make this as quick as the game tonight, but <laughs> unfortunately. My name is Regina Brent. I'm a citizen in the neighborhood of Naperville Township. I'm also uh, a representative of this township, an elected person. Um, I, call, I came here tonight on behalf of two young ladies. I heard about a situation regarding a cosmetology um, completion for their certification and I'm not here to represent them, but I'm here to demonstrate my concern as a citizen. And that's those two students are Kayla Taylor and I believe Kyla Hamilton. I came here tonight just to share with you a personal story of mine. 48 years ago, I made a big mistake. I was a kid, 16 years old, pregnant mother, went to school, suppressed a pregnancy with some gear to keep from anyone knowing and because I was ashamed principal found out about it. At that time, people say, you know, they squealed on you. So I had to be called to this <coughs> principal's office 
and he says, your mother have to come up here. When we got up to the school, he explained that I would have to go to um, a uh, pregnant girl's school. And I burst out with tears. He says, why are you crying? Why should you not go to the same school? What makes you different than any other girl? I said, because if I go there, I may not ever come out. All I'm saying to you is that was Mr. Pendoffy. And I wish that he was here tonight because I do know he's on this board somewhere. He had an open heart. He told me, he says, you know what? You're gonna come up here every week, report to your teachers, and you will graduate on time. He gave me a break. And all I'm saying to you is that tonight, I hope that Mr. Pendoffy can see that I served four mayors of the city of Chicago, four attorney generals. I'm a representative of my community. I'm a founding president of an organization, and I have a successful 48-year-old son who served 15 years in the Navy. There's a Mr. Pendoffy in some of your guys' heart to meet these children where they are, even if they take a little more time to complete their lessons. Open up your hearts, open up your mind. Their parent is here tonight. Listen to them. I thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peyton Mutry. Welcome, Peyton. Good evening. My name is Peyton Mitri. I was a four-year varsity lacrosse player at Nico Valley, and I graduated this past spring. First things first, I'd like to shout out both the girls' team and the boys' teams for the success they had this past season. The Nico Valley girls' lacrosse team fought hard for their eighth place title, as well as the boys' lacrosse team, who fought just as hard for theirs and got third in state. Lacrosse is one of the fastest growing sports in the nation. At the 2019 informational meeting for girls' lacrosse, we had 50 girls sign up to try out. When the cost to play in District 204 was announced, our numbers dropped to 31 girls. It becomes incredibly difficult to grow the sport at Niqua and throughout our district when, I, when it is cost prohibitive. At such a high cost to play, the only similarity we feel to other student athletes is that we can wear the Niqua name on our uniforms. While our peers are, playing, are paying $200 per sport, we are paying more than three times that amount and are excluded from the cost benefits of participating in, mul in multiple sports. I speak not only for my fellow athletes, but also for the parents. Why do lacrosse parents continue to pay the absurd amount it costs to play lacrosse in District 204? Because they know that District 204 athletes, Nico Valley specifically, has the talent to dr to, and the drive to continue to succeed, bring home state plaques, and wear Nico Valley's name proudly. However, it is impossible to continue to succeed at the level we did this year if we continue with multiple years of parent funding. We will continue to lose numbers on both ends, and by the time those years are up, Negro Valley Lacrosse will not be able to be sus sustained, much less will we be able to excel or compete between our sister district and Naperville. What we ask of you is the chance to let us play at the same cost of other athletes and to show us how proud you are of who we are and what we can do for our district. We hold you on a pedestal, so please help us do the same. On behalf of the Negro Valley Lacrosse teams, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peg. And last speaker for non-agenda items is Petra Lakanik. Hi, welcome. Good evening, board. Good evening, everybody. I'm just talking about the same lacrosse. So two years ago, we made the decision to make lacrosse this, um, a school sport, which I think was absolutely the right decision for us district and we as a team that if you look at the boys and the girls team they've really I think made the schools proud and I am a parent of kids that were three kids playing lacrosse I moved to this district because of lacrosse when we moved here six years ago I was trying to find a school that had lacrosse because all three of my kids were playing lacrosse and we're really passionate about it and I was trying to find a school district that that goes with that and we found Nikwa Valley, we found this area, and we love the area, and we love lacrosse. So I have two girls that's freshmen and a senior that just graduated, all of them playing lacrosse. 
So my fees this year was 2000, almost $2,400 for my kids to play lacrosse. If they played basketball or any other sport, we would have paid $600. So I really want you to think about the cost impact that it has on families, especially when you've got multiple children that plays lacrosse. And I feel like if you've got one kid playing, there's going to be multiple kids playing. We have boys that has got at least two boys right now in the program that's paying 1800 which is a lot. I mean, it, is, it makes it harder for families to come into the program. And we want to be fair to all kids. We want to give these kids opportunities. The lacrosse team is such a welcoming team. The kids that go in there, they form new friendships. They are part of a team. They're part of a winning team. The girls' um, JV team won all their games. They didn't lose any games. The boys' um, JV lost one. The girls went eighth in state. The boys went third in state. So we really have got such great program there. We just need to grow it because we want to be, continue to be successful. And I think w if we have to keep on paying the fees, I don't know how many people can do it, but we're excluding kids that cannot afford that. And I don't think that's fair to families to exclude kids from a program. And I'm really urging you to really take this in con consideration that we want our kids to succeed. We want our kids to belong and if a kid is playing lacrosse this is where they belong this is their place where they can succeed where they make their friends and make friends with other kids they might have never made friends my daughter said tonight mom i made friends with people that i would thought never would make friends with they came from scullin there wasn't a lot of kids from scullin in their classes she was one of the only ones in a lot of her classes and now after playing lacrosse she made so many new friends and really felt like she belongs and i really urge you guys to please look at the cost because going forward we can uh, parents can't sustain this thank you thank you we're now moving to our superintendent report and consent agi consent agenda item approval we'll begin with the superintendent report dr sullivan okay i don't have a lot this evening um our legislators in springfield were um very busy closing out this last general session. There are a number of bills that will impact us, including um, Senate Bill 28, dealing with the school day and reverting back to the old school cold language. So as such, we'll likely bring you a revised 1920 school calendar that will eliminate those half days of school attendance that no one likes, um, as well as plan for e-learning um, to be used in lieu of emergency days for the upcoming school year. So those things will be coming your way soon. And it finally, it's hard to believe that the 2018-19 school year is in the books. Our students finished up last Thursday and our teachers finished up on Friday. So we hope all of our students and families have uh, a, great sum, um, gr a great summer. We're already busy working on uh, getting things ready for fall and some of our summer programs I think already started and I know ESY starts next week. So um, that's really all that I have tonight. Okay, thank you. I need approval of consent agenda items D through R. Do I have a motion to approve them? I'll make a motion to approve consent agenda items D through R. Second. Okay, we have a motion in several seconds. <laughs> uh, any discussion? Hearing none, uh, Jackie, please call the roll. Ms. Peel? Aye. Ms. Grover? Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Mr. Rising? Yes. Motion passes. Now go to our action items. The first action item is the approval of the Illinois Association of School Boards annual dues. Do I have a motion to approve the 2019-20 IASB annual dues? <coughs> I'll make a motion. I make. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the Board of Education approve the annual dues for the Illinois Association of School Board. Second. Uh, uh, there's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Has um, do you know, Mike, if there's been any discussion because with our other professional organ and, and 
we probably should clarify that the Illinois Association of School Board is our professional organization. So this is where we get professional learning. Um, you know, I mean, it's our professional organization as non-paid elective school board members. Um, but I know in some of our other professional organizations we belong to that they've looked at dues. Have you heard anything from a state level if they're looking at that? Um, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just asking. You might not know. Yeah, in fact, Mark, um, I did meet with Tom Bertrand. He came to Indian Prairie District 204, and um, one of my concerns was with the dues, and my concern was other organizations were looking at fun, uh, uh, new formulas to figure out dues, and was IASB looking at the, a different formula also? Um, Tom indicated to me that um, he was looking at that um, and that several districts have expressed that concern also. And so one of the reasons that I asked that this be put as an action item instead of a consent agenda item is I want to be clear where I kind of stand with IASB. I think they have been invaluable to us in several different ways. They've been invaluable to us in terms of helping our board grow when we came, when we needed it. And they provided um, training for us, both through self-evaluation and through the conferences. Um, they're, they're very assistive in terms of when we have policies. Um, that has been very helpful for us. They also serve as advocacy for us, for uh, our legislature, which over time we've needed help with <laughs> advocacy. So I think they have done a yeoman's job. Yep. Yet, as, as things change, as time changes, things need to change. And I think it's important that IASB does look at their dues and maybe some of their training packages in order to help serve higher functioning boards in a better way. Yeah. To be fair, Tom has been very responsive. I want to continue to have those conversations with him. I think it's important to do so, and I think they will respond positively. Yet I want to make sure that everyone knows what our status with IASB yeah. is. And, and I'll echo your sentiments. I mean, uh, I, I think they're phenomenal, and they, they represent us with our legislators down in Springfield. <clears throat> and I understand that we're the, I think, fourth largest district in the state. Um, but with things being evaluated and looked at from a state funding for public schools at a different, with a different lens now with, with evidence-based funding, I think that also needs to be taken into consideration because we are not a, um, a, a very uh, rich, if you will, um, or have a lot of localized uh, assessed value uh, district as some other districts. So I think that also needs to be a component and hopefully, you know, Hopefully they'll they'll look at that as well. But thanks, Kathy. Mike, I, go ahead, Mike, I Susan. Have, I did have a question. Have we? I don't know whether Tom asked for any feedback or suggestions, or if they are going to request schools to help take a look um, and provide any input into that fee structure. Um, Tom was open to that. My intent is to share the Legislative Education Network of DuPage do structure with IASB in order that they will do that pro pro probably with our business manager, Jay Strang, who is one of the architects of that new do structure, just to have a basis of discussion for them. Okay. So that Thank you. that would be I'm I'm going to initiate the next step with IASB. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. I would just say, um, yeah, it, it's um, ISB has been essential in getting this um, our current board where it's at. So 
you know, we do have to always keep that in mind. I do think there are some um, we're, we're room for improvement in offering programs for boards that start to function the way they're supposed to function. Um, and I think the fee structure, too, does need to be looked at. So I think those were good points to bring up and um, maybe have to be a, a good functioning board to bring them up at this point. <laughs> but <laughs> um, So that's, that's uh, they've created their own worst enemy with us. So <laughs> 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 and that's a good thing. So I, I think uh, um, is se certainly not uh, an organization that I would want to see us walk away from um, because uh, it takes constant work to be a good functioning board. So uh, I appreciate the conversation we started with. Thank you. Ms. Grover, anything? No. I think I do have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, Jackie, call the roll, please. Ms. Peel? Aye. Mr. Rising? Aye. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Grover? Yes. Next agenda item and action item is the consideration um, and the approval of the superintendent search agreement with Ray and Associates. Do I have a motion to approve the agreement with Ray and Associates? I approve that we, uh, I, motion. <laughs> I have a motion to approve the superintendent search service agreement with Ray and Associates. Second. I have a motion and second. Discussion. I'm sure you're going to make a similar comment to this, but I just, <laughs> you know, I, we interviewed three and I think they were all phenomenal and, and, uh, um, you know, I, I I don't think any of us could say there was bad things or about any of the three. Um, you know, it's just kind of where we had a comfort level, and uh, I think we made a great decision. I look forward to working with Rain Associates. Anybody else? I guess I echo that, Mark. All three uh, superintendent search firms made presentations, did a great job. It was a level of comfort, and probably that was the discerning factor in terms of our selection. Any other discussion? Hearing none, Jack, call the roll. Ms. Grover? Yes. Ms. Peel? Aye. Mr. Rising? Aye. Ms. Deming? Aye. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Motion passes. We now move to the discussion portion of our meeting. Our First, oh yes, we do. Our first one is on the student behavioral review, and that's where our public comment is. So it is now time for public comment for agenda items. Uh, we have one speaker, so we ask that you limit your conversation for us for three minutes. And again, the same parameters exist when addressing the board. Please respect the confidentiality and safety of our students. Uh, we ask that you be cognizant this open meeting and is available to all age groups and consider the audience members. And again, public comment represents the voice and the opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from board members during the meeting, but follow-up will, will be provided by an administrator as appropriate. With that, I think I'm Marianne Sprinkle Walker. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Good evening. I'm Marianne Sprinkle Walker. I am a parent of a recent Gregory, Gregory Middle School graduate. I'm also the Nequa Valley Pass. Uh, co-chair and PTSA for Nico Valley Scholarship Committee Chair. Our concern is equality. We need consistent treatment of what's deemed inappropriate, disruptive behavior, or disorderly conduct. I'm here because my son, husband, and I have witnessed um, subjective decisions based on sex and race. As an example, my son was told to say, please leave me alone when a student was bothering him. 
and he was asked to go in the hall and write, please leave me alone 10 times. Then in a reverse incident, he was actually given a detention. I would say to parents to listen to your students, take action, don't let it ride. We punished our son following a March report of an incident. He was on punishment for two months until we realized after a trip to the school in May, two weeks before graduation, that none of the behavior reported to us was inappropriate. In fact, they had not even asked him what happened. Building and district leadership, if you're making data-driven decisions, our students are at risk. 9% of the population on the data you're about to receive um, are African American students in the district, but 33% of them receive out of school suspensions. Middle school is actually 50%. My ask is that you analyze this data at a building level because my son for two years was trying to communicate to us what he was experiencing and as a typical working parent, we believe the administration and the teachers and not our students until we were able to go to the school and speak with the administration and call our son into the office that we understood the challenges that he was facing. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And now the behavior review. <clears throat> Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Sullivan. Uh, my name is Brad Hillman. I'm the assistant superintendent who works with the middle schools. And on behalf of the teaching and learning team, I would like to thank you for allowing us to come before the board and present the annual student behavior and interventions review in accordance with board policy 7190 associated with student behavior. Joining me tonight to present our work is Dr. Lee, assistant superintendent for high schools, and Mrs. Johnson, assistant superintendent for elementaries. And additionally, we have invited to assist us in the presentation one of our friends from 360 Youth Services. We have Margo Smith, clinical director, here with us tonight. Later in the presentation, she will be explaining the wonderful work that 360 Youth Services is doing within our schools. During our presentation tonight, we are happy to take your questions throughout the presentation, but we also have a place at the end of the presentation specifically marked for questions. As has been the case in previous years, we have seen an overall decrease in the use of out-of-school suspension. We truly believe that this is because we have wonderful supporting parents and additionally our school administrators and teachers are working diligently to continue to create a positive and welcoming environment for all students. While we still have work to do, the overall trend in our data continues to be positive. We have 99% of our students not receiving an out of school suspension for the 18-19 school year. The purpose of tonight is to review our current interventions that we have in place focusing on keeping kids in class, to review the 18-19 school data by level, and also for 360 Youth Services to share with us the history and the work that they are doing currently within our schools for the 18-19 school year. <clears throat> we use a multi-tiered system of approach to, to, be, to be able to support our students. We have universal supports that we try to do with all of our students, things like positive behavior intervention supports, PBIS, intentionally foster relationships with students and parents, and trying to establish a classroom climate with class meetings and increased student engagement that all students want to be a part of and learn from. However, every now and then we do have to work with students to be able to go beyond the basic level of support that we provide for them. And in here, we begin to look at components of restorative practices as one of the major things that we are trying to implement throughout um, all of our buildings in which we are trying to get students to understand the impact of their, their negative behavior on their peers or on the school, and also be able to try to assist um, being able to provide better relationships, um, maybe a targeted individual that they can meet with whenever there is a stressful situation that is taking place that they don't quite know what to do, 
who is that trusted individual, individual that they can definitely go to and really set up that relationship in a very positive fashion for them. You'll remember um, about three years ago when Public Act 99456 was put into place um, that there are only two reasons that we use for out-of-school suspension. One of those is a threat to school safety and the other is a significant disrupt disruption to other students' learning opportunities. We continue to work with buildings and ensure that those are the reasons that students are out of school suspended. When you look at our overall data, um, we had set, you as a board had set a goal that we wanted the percentage of students receiving an out of school suspension at or below 1%. And this year, 0.9% of our students did receive an, an out of school suspension. So we did meet that goal. Uh, just to give you some perspective and put some context to this, nationally about 5% of students are suspended. So to have 0.9% of students is significantly less. And then you can see the breakdown there in elementary, middle, and high of the, number of the percent of students receiving out of school suspensions. The next slide shows you the um, six year suspension data for elementary schools. And as you can see, there has been a significant decline um, over the last six years. In those last three years, we have seen a plateau where we're hovering right around 20 students, elementary students, that receive an out-of-school suspension. Um, you can also see the racial breakdowns there, and we continue to have uh, some disparity amongst those racial groups, and we speak regularly as a principal group about how we can um, eliminate that and look at uh, and do trainings on things like implicit bias. Um, the main reason that students in elementary school have been out of school suspended is due to physical aggression. Um, now, in elementary school, physical aggression really looks more like a lack of self-regulation. Um, as an elementary student loses control and are unable um, to regain self-control, they might lash out. Um, push things, throw things, that kind of stuff. It's not um, like a fight. Um, what we do with students, and one of the things that has been really successful is, is uh, engaging with parents. Um, if there is an out-of-school suspension, um, regardless of the length, we have asked parents to do re-entry meetings with us. Um, parents come in when students re-enter Um, parents come in when students re-enter into the building and we do a meeting with the principal, typically the parent and then the student. And that way the student helps see that we're all on the same page, we're all on the same team and we review the strategies that students can use if they've lost control. We also do self-regulation instruction, sometimes at a tier one level where all students are receiving it, but most specifically on um, a student level where students need a little extra self-regulation instruction, just how can they um, get control of themselves. Most often schools are using things like zones of regulation, which shows a thermometer of what color you are and how you can um, calm yourself down. We also use check-in and check-out with students who, have, um, who maybe struggle with self-control and that is uh, meeting with somebody in the morning, um, really giving them a pep talk, setting some goals for the day, and then at the end of the day, somebody checking out with them and seeing how they've done on those goals. That way every student knows that there's a cheerleader for them in that school, um, regardless of how their day has gone. And then of course we do problem solving um, meetings, both um, on individual situations as well as whole school for students that are struggling. At the middle school level, we do see that there was an increase in the number of out-of-school suspensions. <clears throat> that increase is about right in line with the four, last four-year um, average, give or take a couple of students. Um, unfortunately, the increase that we saw, the greatest increase from that, from that total number of suspension was in our African-American and uh, black students. Um, <clears throat> that, that reference number of 29%, 29 students is approximately equal to about um, f a little less than 4% of our African-American students receiving a suspension. So about 96% of our African-American students did not. Um, 
we also see um, subtle changes in the other um, demographic groups, but everybody is still um, right in line and our numbers are, are still relatively low um, at 99% of our students not receiving um, an out of school suspension. One of the three, uh, we have three major areas where we see an out of school suspension being utilized for physical aggression, gross insubordination and reckless conduct. The physical aggression is probably similar to as uh, Ms. Johnson uh, explained it at the elementary level. For gross insubordination though, I do want to make sure that everybody understands what we're looking at there. Um, gross insubordination is when we were looking at the willful failure to respond or carry out a reasonable directive by an adult. Um, however, when it begins to move into a gross insubordination, it now begins to look at where the school personnel feel that they can forecast a substantial injury or disruption that is of major, um, that is of an escalated quality. It's not just a simple I didn't do what I was asked to do, but rather that there are some severe consequences that could be associated with not following that, that specific request. What do we do to be able to address um, the negative interactions at school? We are trying to make sure that we have parent reentry meetings. So this way, again, we are getting our parents into the building, making sure that we are providing a solid front um, with the school and the parents together, making sure that students understand that we are working together to meet their best, best needs. And then we also are utilizing 360 Youth Referral. Um, you'll be hearing quite a bit about the referral program later on in the presentation um, from Margot Smith. And the other piece that we want to make sure that we understand is the team support. Uh, at the middle school level, all of our students are on teams and we have teachers who meet on a regular basis to be able to discuss progress that students are making academically emotionally and socially. And the team support is a huge um, uh, benefit to our students because now we have teachers who are wrapping around students when they are undergoing maybe uh, a change in behavior and we're able to identify that in all places and be able to try to respond to that in the most appropriate fashion and be able to put students in a much uh, better place and of comfort to be able to make sure that they're successful at school. Similar to the other two levels, um, when you look at the past seven years of data, you will see a gradual decline in the number of actual suspensions for out-of-school suspensions across all of the categories, uh, particularly when we look at the total number of suspensions. Since we've been tracking this and presenting this to the data, you know, we've had the lowest point that we've had in the past seven years. Uh, Something that the data doesn't share that is important for this board and, and our parents and um, our student community to understand is that it starts in the classroom, it starts with our teachers and the environment that they build for our kids, uh, the number of um, support and relationships that are built in that classroom to keep student behavior from ever escalating to a level uh, where it becomes one of those two categories of it either being a threat to school safety or a disruption to other students' learning environment. Also begins with the counselors and our deans and the amount of work that they do with the number of students who are uh, potentially uh, could be uh, based on some of the choices that they make um, and what they do to help remediate those choices so that our students uh, continue to progress in a positive manner and contribute to a positive school learning environment. I always talk about at the high school, it's like progressing from the children's table at Thanksgiving to the uh, adult table. There's a wider menu of options. And with, unfortunately, with some of those options, um, they can result in some greater uh, infractions. But what's important to remember is we continue to provide interventions for these options so that students have the support and what they need to make good choices. Some of those interventions are very similar to what you've already heard. Uh, we'll be hearing about some of those in just a moment with our um, partnership with 360 Youth Services. Um, one thing of note that we did notice uh, this year, uh, last year we talked a lot about vaping a little bit. Uh, you'll notice that that is not up there. Um, and we, we look at that for uh, a couple of reasons. One, um, we believe uh, some of the uh, education that we've been able to put out is starting to seep in. Uh, we've seen some change in laws on a national level and some uh, greater attention to that. 
Uh, but that being said, we don't want to read too much into that. We know that students are very savvy as well, and we continue to monitor uh, how some of these, um, some of those choices are being made. Uh, we continue to um, look at restorative circles uh, and the support that we have in helping students um, uh, as they come back into the environment and transition back in, um, the form of harm that was done and how we can help support that and remediate that. And then again, uh, our work uh, through the um, ISS coordinators in our in-school suspension uh, rooms uh, and what they're doing to help those students make positive choices. Speaking of positive choices, I think um, over the past years we made a very positive choice, uh, Dr. Sullivan, in, in starting a partnership with uh, 360U Services. Um, before we turn it over to Margo, I just uh, can't, uh, again, let you know how much uh, our, this partnership has meant not only for our district and not just for what you've seen in the data, but really uh, just supporting the school environment and they've really just become a part of, of Indian Prairie and, and what our school culture is. So with that, I'll turn it over to Margo Smith. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Good evening. This school year marks the third year of our partnership after we first did a pilot at Matia Valley. So technically, we've been in a school for full years. As a reminder, this partnership began as a response to legislation related to minimizing exclusionary disciplinary practices. Youth being seen on site by a 360 counselor is one option for school staff as they look at the needs of the individual student that is struggling to engage or thrive at school due to emotional or behavioral concerns or outside stressors. Additionally, the program has always served kids in a preventative manner as well. So we're at the three high schools. This year we expanded to all seven middle schools as well. This slide specifically shows within the alternative to suspension track as well as the preventative track, the different referral reasons for students. The referral reason is typically identified by the school staff that is referring the youth into the program. Keep in mind with the middle school students, parents do have to sign consent before the student can engage. Um, high school students are allowed to be seen if they're over the age of 12 for a limited amount of sessions. Next, you can see a visual representation of the referral reason, regardless of whether it's alternative to suspension or preventative. Clearly, social emotional is the big catch-all. Um, this is, can kind of vary um, by referring party, but typically that means that the student has some type of um, emotional issue such as anxiety or depression or an outside stressor that's really impacting their ability to do well during the school day. Alternative to suspension numbers have remained consistent, but students served has increased as we've grown to more and more schools throughout the years. So as you can see, alternative suspension is 23% of the reasons we're serving students, and then the remainder are the preventative track students, which is 77%. The main tool that we're using to determine outcomes is the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. This behavioral screening computes a score from 1 to 40 for each student. This year we used a st statistical analysis on the students that were able to do both an opening and closing questionnaire, and we were able to compute positive change. Um, we actually were able to d demonstrate that we had a two-point difference um, for students on their opening SDQ compared to their closing at the end of services. It might be helpful to know that for middle school, they attended an average of nine sessions, and at the high school level, they attended an average of seven sessions. The no data available would refer to a student that was unable to attend their last session with us, um, or for some reason wasn't able to complete services. Um, the no change would show that there was not a, si a significant change in any of the data, and then a negative change obviously would show that their scores actually worsened after our services. So luckily, the positive change is by far the largest. We're very excited to see that this is working, and not just subjectively from staff reports, student report, parents report, but we actually have data to support that as well. In addition, so all that data supports uh, or explains what we're doing individually with students throughout the school day. As the program has ex you know, grown after, through the years, um, each building has gotten creative in figuring out how else they can use their 360 staff person 
Um, we're very grateful that the partnership allows each building to use us in a way that best helps their students. So some examples of other things that we're doing are up on there, including going into in-school suspension rooms and meeting with students on a one-time basis if they happen to be there that day. Um, we're doing skills presentations and things like reco recover, uh, credit recovery classrooms. Um, so once a week we're going in there for 15 minutes teaching a skill that would benefit a student that's in a credit recovery classroom. We're doing things like staff trainings, um, student mediation, and those kind of things. So where does all this lead us in the future? <clears throat> Obviously our continued use of 360 youth services, we think that that is a wonderful partnership that has been very positive. Um, both for students during the school day, but also to be able to um, assist families in finding supports outside of school and to be able to increase the um, number of supports that families have, not just at school, but in other places within the community. And 360 um, does a wonderful job of providing those, those referrals and those supports outside of school. We also want to continue to focus on building positive relationships with all of our students. It is a major point of emphasis. It is something that we, we know we can always get better at. We're never satisfied, and we always want to make sure that all students, every student knows who is the trusting adult within the building that they can definitely go to in a time of need. Additionally, the district SEL team is putting together um, curriculum that is going to be implemented universally. And then finally, we want to make sure that we are increasing our partnership with our parents. Um, we know that there is, um, really nothing that can um, probably help us better in, in maintaining um, strong, discipl strong discipline numbers as far as reducing the amount of out of school suspension as working with our parents in a partnership. And we look forward to continuing to try to build those relationships. And with that, um, we have questions. I might have a few, but <laughs> I, I'm just gonna say one thing here. Um, We've come so far since the time I've been on this board. It's pretty incredible, and we're seeing numbers go down. We're seeing our Tier 1 instruction improve and creating those relationships, and I think that's the key to why things are going down. Um, and, and so I applaud that you guys are still tackling it and saying, what else can we do? because we want our kids to succeed. It's not just to stay in school, we want them su to succeed. And so um, I'm just looking at the numbers going, oh my gosh, um, I, I work in a district where those numbers would be our goal <laughs> to reach. So um, kudos to you guys. Um, and and I, I loved the gross insubordination, the dis the difference between just no I don't want to work right now um, and no but I'm going to do something that's dangerous or could hurt somebody else or myself so I think that's really important to understand um, that that's where we've gone and that it, to me that is a 10 year difference that a gross insubordination 10 years ago might have been no I don't want to do my work right now um, which will only escalate a, a, a student who is dysregulated so uh, again kudos and I'm if I'm understanding the vaping thing are you saying you're going away from calling it an infraction to more of a health concern um, I would say both and okay. here's why uh, we know through recent Illinois uh, youth survey data that the far majority of our students are not involved in that practice Building upon that, we know that we need to reach the students that are. Okay. And so I think the only way we can do that is continue to uh, hold the ones accountable uh, who, are, who engage in that practice, but also educate them and then the ones who are, are teetering you know, on, on making that choice, uh, either due to a, a wide variety of factors. So I think, you know, again, this year I, we saw that it, it um, uh, I, I wouldn't say significantly dropped, but enough that it wasn't something that, uh, you know, came up in, in, in the rise that like we had seen before. And then a large part of that was due to um, less repeatings, uh, less uh, uh, number of students who uh, were egregious, you know, in the use of that. So I think we'll continue to take sort of a, a dual approach in, in how we treat it. 
Okay, that's great. I, I, um, that was just really enlightening when you said that. I think that's the appropriate way to, to handle it. Um, the uh, at the elementary level, we're still not s having 360 youth services um, refer out. Um, I'm hoping that's a talking point in the future. And um, the other part of that that I wondered about was um, you keep talking about the importance of connecting the parents, and sometimes you had all those categories that you said you refer for. I didn't see a family you know, just family issues, family relationship issues sometimes are what comes to our school and that's what our kids are dealing with and that's what the parents are dealing with. Um, so family counseling is often the most appropriate referral. So are we having those kind of discussions? Can I jump uh, in? Yeah. yeah. So that would fall under the social emotional category because we're definitely seeing on the referral forms that there are, there's family stress at home and so they would like the student to be seen. We do, if it is a family issue, and that's very clear, we do invite the family in. So often at the middle school, um, the parents are able to actually come to the school. We've had some family sessions on site during the wow. school day. Awesome. Or we um, try to do it before the parent goes to work early in the morning. Um, there are times we're also offering, every student is offered if, if uh, family sessions are appropriate and they're willing, they can come to our office as well. So this year that's also happened with some middle school students where the family has come in a couple times um, or will engage on their own, you know, privately outside of the school. But uh, so I think the school is flagging that the best they can and offering. And again, that um, families have to be willing, obviously, and things, but we're trying everything we can to engage them and, and offer them support. Good. Good. Susan. Thank you. Um, I did have a, a couple of questions. Can you share with me on the preventative, on the boundaries? What Can you share with me what that, that boundaries area, what does that mean specifically? Sure, a boundary violation would be something like um, inappropriate texting that's going on between students, um, okay. or, or an actual physical boundary violation, touching a student without consent, um, something like that. Okay, thank so, you. So something um, that wouldn't then, constitute assault, but is some type of infraction deemed by the school. Okay. Okay, thank, I was just a little unclear on that. Thank you. And then I know we, we chatted a little bit um, earlier regarding, um, a mention was made regarding uh, implicit bias and kind of looking at some of these areas and where we wind up with some of our students of color, specifically um, African American. You know, last year looks like the elementary, um, we did come down last year, they were almost, it was almost 50% of the number this year, 33%. Um, our middle school, though, just wondering on that, we did go up there um, to 41%. And, and so that last year, it looks like it was about a quarter. And then our middle, our high school seems to be right around about the same. Do we have any ideas potentially where um, that difference is happening on the middle school with those those particular, that particular population? And then um, the second question, well, let me let you answer that question first. So in looking at the middle school, <clears throat> we were aware that this particular um, demographic group was increasing as far as the number of suspensions. And when talking with the building principals on a, on a, on a monthly basis, we meet, we go over suspensions on a case-by-case -case basis. And what we're really trying to look at is both the, the, the implicit bias piece, which is could, could we have put a student uh, in, a, in a negative position um, and therefore we were the group that was potentially causing a student to lash out or is there something else that is, that is happening and how is that, what's our response to what is happening and how is it that we are again putting students in places to be successful. I, I, the only thing I can tell you is that in having conversations with the building principals, I do believe that students are obviously being reviewed independently and being able to be evaluated based on the behavior that we saw. Um, I believe that we are working to be able to make um, students and put them in, in the best position possible to be successful. Um, and the implicit bias training, I believe, is, is part of that. Okay, I, and I, I should have first said um, I really I, I applaud the work that we're doing because I think we are overall moving in the, the right direction, and I am so impressed with the 
focus that um, the administrators, and especially the school leadership, school leadership is giving to this particular area. The follow-up area that I just wanted to ask, I think that the partnerships with 360 is very, is so helpful and so impactful. Do we have any particular, when we're doing the meetings with the, as we bring uh, students, parents, school leadership and the teacher together, are we able to understand with any of the school's leadership and teachers whether there are actions that are taken by students of different in the same manner that may students that look different but that are doing the same thing um, I guess almost on an implicit bias type of conversation but are we are we able to have any of those um, conversations as the students re-enter along with 360 and the um, school leadership? So um, a, if I'm understanding, have, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say, do, is, do we have any personnel, you know, on the 360 end that are able to, to help make sure that we are looking at things from a 360 perspective um, regarding all of our students and as we work with our teachers and our building leadership. If I'm understanding the question correctly, at our reentry meetings, um, I know that um, a wide range of topics are going to be discussed. Uh, the first and foremost and most important topic is um, working with the student to make sure that they uh, are full aware of the not only the circumstances that may have led up to the decision that they made, uh, but also um, how they would reshape their behavior to avoid that choice in the future. And I can share with you that if there's anything that's possibly learned from parents being involved in that and feedback that's given about uh, how the situation occurred, that is always taken and listened to and then uh, talked about not only with um, other uh, staff that are in the building at the administrator level, but uh, also in, in the sense that as we um, take a critical eye and review suspension data on a monthly basis, one of the questions that is always asked, I know not just by myself, but um, Brad and Laura as well at their meetings, uh, is looking at how situations were handled any anomalies that exist, and what did we learn from our standpoint as well. So we use every single uh, infraction as a way not to only um, share, um, share performance, share uh, things that are working, but also taking a critical eye at ourselves to, to see what can we learn about this situation. Could it have also been avoided on our end uh, in, in the sense of of making sure that the student is is in the best situation possible so that they're not making uh, a choice that can lead to something else. Uh, did I answer it? Thank, thank you. I, I, that, that helped clarify um, some things, um, definitely. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Natasha, any questions? Um. Can you explain um, cause what the positive behavior intervention is? So um, positive behavior intervention uh, stands for PBIS, um, and that is a national uh, program that helps schools look at their processes to ensure that they are teaching, making database de teaching behaviors, making database decisions, reviewing things regularly, and using the multi-tiered system of support. So there are um, strategies and interventions that all kids get. Then there are strategies and interventions that a small group of students may get. And then there are strategies and interventions that are very intensive that only the students that need those that level of intervention get. And um, all of our um, elementary and middle schools are PBIS schools, so they have those systems in place. Okay. Um, so I noticed with the middle school and the high school, there's an increase um, in the out of suspensions that happens. 
for middle school it was 1%, in high school it becomes 1.9%. In every demographics, there's an increase in out-of-school suspensions. Is there a reason for that? Do you have any thinking about that, or what is your thoughts on that? I'll speak at the high school. Um, actually, I believe last year we were just over 2% total suspensions. I'd have to double check um, that, but we were, I believe, at about 2.2%. Um, and um, the total number of suspensions has declined. If you're thinking in terms of percentages as with our enrollment <laughs> decrease, um, I think that has also um, continued to hold true, even though we were in a period of declining enrollment. Um, I would, looking at the demographic groups, I'd have to look at them again individually. Um, but I, I think overall, um, w while um, while we're seeing a trend trend down, uh, we know that we can still continue to still have work because um, you know even having one student out of school um, is not a success for us. Uh, we want students in class, and we'll continue to look at any trends whether trending upward or down, you know, I think what's most important is how can we make sure that our students are always, you know, making the best possible choices. Because of the narrow um, categories that in which um, students can be suspended, we know that um, if we have to um, have them outside of the building because of those two categories, the goal and focus is always to reintegrate them into the building as quickly as possible. And so that'll continue to be a growth area that we're looking at. Uh, I think, again, uh, knowing that there sometimes are, are, are situations that become a threat to school safety or a huge disruption to student learning environment, we just continue just to, to work with those students to keep those situations from escalating to that type of, of category. Um, I know we we had the pilot project in high school with that resource, um, the Wednesday program. Did you see a decline in I don't know with 360 services during that period because the kids kind of got a break? I'm not sure which school they piloted it in, in but the, in the three high schools there was they're, like a you're ta they're talking about the academic, the oh I'm sorry the, the Wednesday thing yeah yeah our um, our um, Oh gosh! Every uh, school is calling it something. Different, yes, that's what I'm trying to think of. It so <laughs> tribe time at Wabanzi. We've right. got right. So I was uh, wondering with Mustang that Hour because the kids got a break, and you know, did the, did you see with, with 360 the counseling services? That, was there a decrease during that period when the pilot program? We're only in one school on Wednesday, so the other high schools were there Tuesday, Thursday, so it didn't impact us. But we actually uh, met with one of the high schools recently about intentionally being there next year on Wednesday because they think we could be used during that period as an optional group for students to attend so we were brainstorming some ideas um, to use it intentionally I know we have a lot of anecdotal data right now that we're going to looking forward to presenting to the board in a more formal manner um, uh, towards the, the conclusion of the second pilot uh, later this fall so we hopefully will have some uh, some hard numbers um, that we'll be able to present to show some some of the positivity that we think will will, will be occurring Thank you for all coming up with all these different ideas to help our students. Thank you. Mark. Uh, yeah, I'll just echo, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the middle school jump in our African American um, out of school suspensions. I'm hoping that's just kind of one of those blips that we've seen before and, and we kind of get back on track of trending downwards. Um, Kudos to our high school African American out of school suspensions because that that's great data. I mean, we're trending down significantly in that area. While it's still, you know, 28 percent um, is our African American students at the high school level. You know, and, and like was mentioned, they represent about nine percent of our student population. That's still concerning, but. Um, you know, something else to notice, and I'm sure you guys have looked at this, but <clears throat> I was kind of comparing, and, and these discipline numbers, I mean, if you look nationwide, we're, as Laura mentioned, we're phenomenal. Uh, I mean, you know, and actually the, the African-American and Hispanic suspension rate is 
extremely higher uh, if you look at nationwide statistics. But what I also notice is there is a correlation between chronic absenteeism in our African American and Hispanic population, which could be correlated to, you know, when you when you have chronic absenteeism, it seems that there's a correlation to to disciplinary problems. Is that is, and I'm asking because I'm not an educator. Is that data that's been looked at and 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 discussed? Because I'm wondering if there is a, a correlation there. Because I know it's hard to believe I was a disciplined kid in high school. Um, <laughs> uh, I had a lot of discipline issues actually, but you know. It, for me, it was not feeling like a belonging, or I wasn't as, as involved. And it wasn't until I got more involved where my discipline issues started going down. So, you know, I know that we encourage that involvement, um, and we're trying to increase the, the sense of the feeling of belonging. But can you just address the chronic absenteeism thing just real quick, one of you? Um, at the elementary level, we've been doing some work with chronic absenteeism. We have not crossed those two numbers and looked okay. at it discipline-wide unless we're looking at a specific student. Um, and then, of course, when you're looking at, in problem solving around a specific student, you notice patterns of disruption as well as patterns of chronic absenteeism and maybe come to some conclusions like you just shared where a student isn't feeling like they're belonging and we try to get them connected with somebody so that that can be um, perhaps alleviated. I think at the elementary level at least and probably it trends on the up, upward is I would venture to say that our chronic absenteeism students are more avoiding things than doing behaviors that require them to be out of school suspended and so it probably is two sets of kids. That's a good enough answer for all three levels. I just because I want to have a couple other things I just want to ask really quick. Um, you know I, I love the numbers we're looking at. I, I also think our, our social workers um, and 360 and what we're doing in our schools is wonderful. I have to think a lot of this is attributed to Senate Bill 100 that looked at creating a restorative plan for our students to kind of get them back on track. Um, and I don't think that's maybe mentioned enough because I think that has been a huge benefit um, as much as we all you know, kind of thought about it, a lot of work that was involved when that came about, I think it was the 16, 17 school year. Um, but uh, our numbers continued to have, I mean, we were already trending downward, so I think that just helped things. Um, I, I did have a question regarding 360, though, and, and please don't take offense to this because I love 360. In fact, I use your services. Um, but uh, my question is, you know, I was looking at some of the numbers you were talking about, an average nine sessions per high school student, seven sessions per middle school student. I mean, that's, if we're looking at the out of school suspensions just in those students alone, that's over 2,100 sessions. Um, is that a cost that our district is paying 360 youth services? Because I'm just trying to understand where that. Mark, if you'll remember, this is partially funded by the Indian Prairie Education Foundation. Okay. Um, and partially funded with 360. So we help fundraise. We, we have some money in as a district. IPEF helps us fund that and 360. It's a 50-50 deal. Okay. And, and I just asked because, you know, we've made a concerted effort as a board to hire more social workers. So while I think it's great in sharing those responsibilities, I also think that, you know, our social workers are. are so, Margaret, you want to talk about the kind of people that 360 has in our schools? Sure, yeah. I just They're wanted to clinical. point out, though, that we're not actually seeing every kid that's suspended. Okay. It, so, the number you came up with, 21, like that, we're only seeing certain students. So, the school decides what's the best intervention for the student, we're and 360 tier one is one, type one of option. Tier one type of, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. so we're not seeing all of those students. Okay. Um, yeah. And I would just add our counselors and social workers, they are still supporting a majority of our kids on a daily basis. Um, well, and I think know, there could so. be some great sharing, uh, you know, uh, I mean, because yep. our social workers are in the school, you guys get out of the school, I mean, you have your own outside thing, you know, so I think there could be good sharing of ideas Absolutely. there too. So I, I didn't mean to come too hard on 360. Um, and then just the last thing as far as the vaping goes, um, you know, 
I, I think, you know, we need to try to figure out what we're going to do about this because it's, you know, I was just at a informational seminar in the community last week and, and there was two clinical doctors um, that were there from Linden Oaks and Rosecrans and, and they uh, said it's a major problem. You know, I, I don't know. I, you, you talked about the education piece. I think if we're waiting till middle school or high school to educate these students, it's already too late. I mean, I, I think we need to start that education piece even earlier now because it's gotten to be where vaping is a, a cool, safe thing to do because it's water vapor. You know, I mean, there needs to be more education there, and, and, and I hope we're taking a look at that. But that's all I wanted to say on that. So thanks, guys. You guys are doing awesome. Okay. Um, just a few comments. Um, I wish we wouldn't call this a discipline <laughs> because it connotes the wrong thing. Everything that hopefully you're talking about is changing behavior. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you hear that discipline <laughs> and it's like consequences and punishment. And actually, punishment and consequences don't change behavior. So some of the work that U360 is doing, I think is critical to changing the behavior of our students. And I, I applaud the district. Thank U360 for joining us. There's not many school districts that have a partnership like this that assist kids on a long-term basis. Yet kids are seen seven to nine times. My guess is there's some students and some families that need additional help after those nine sessions. What happens to a kid who still wants to participate in services and behavioral change after they meet with 360 for their seven to nine times? At the middle school level, I don't think we would ever turn a child away from wanting to seek out an adult to have a conversation with and to express the difficulties or concerns that they're having. So my assumption is that while she's providing the average number that is associated with how many times a child is seen, I'm certain that there are probably also many pop-in visits that aren't on that record. There's probably also many other opportunities where students are meeting with somebody outside of school because they're talking to their families about the positive nature of the interactions with 360. And so we're setting um, families up for um, intervention or time to discuss family concerns outside of the school. Um, the other part is that while the 360 Youth Service um, uh, social worker is in working with our students, they're also in consultation with the social workers who are in the building so that way we can continue to have good conversations and find the trusted adult when the 360 youth personnel is not there, as they're there once a week. Um, so we all know that problems for kids or problems for adults do not wait um, for the one day a week when somebody is available. So we do have to have a mechanism in place for students to be able to get their support when the 360 youth service um, count social worker is not there. So those things are all, all happening as well. Now Does that I answer your question? Yes, thank you. I saw that there was a survey given after somebody received services which is great, and I like the data there. Do we ever check with kids six months later or a year later or received U360 services and have a conversation with them to ask how they're doing? Uh, what's going on? Was this helpful? Do you need additional help? So I'm kind of beyond the survey. How do we check up on some of our kids to make sure that they're still doing okay and we're providing the support that they need in order to be successful? It's a good question and I, th I think we do talk about how do we formalize that process because as of now it, it is um, like Brad's mentioning that some students pop in um, and check up with that counselor even when they're completed with services. At the beginning of each school year, now that we've been doing this three years, we also pull a list of students that we saw the last year and just do a couple check-ins in the beginning of the year to see where they at with their skills, how's their stress, things like that, and kind of do some um, kind of review so they can start the year off um, on, on good solid ground. But we should really look at, you know, a formal mechanism for that um, periodically through the year, you know, every three to six months, something like that. That's a, a good idea that we will keep talking about. 
Okay, good. Uh, and one last thing. Um, I feel that like multiple perspective is really important in order to, for constant improvement. Um, I asked a question uh, prior to the meeting about student participation. And it appears that several of our schools do have um, advisory councils or different groups in which principals are asking our students about building climate. Um, I'm kind of a systemic person. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes actually it's not so good because I have to recognize that each school has its own unique personality. But do you think it's like time, like with our high school kids or with our middle school kids to have really specific focus groups in which we ask three or four questions across our middle school? all our school, maybe elementary too, elementary, middle, high schools, similar questions about our climate and our discipline practices and what we could be doing from their per perspective on how to make a better environment for them to participate in. Mark, I think that's a great question and I, I appreciate you asking that. Uh, I can tell you that that question is also being asked by our principals. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that we've had some discussion over the past years is uh, actually talking about how um, one of the things they found with their principal advisory councils were, um, you know, sometimes they're not as, uh, you know, in terms of a broad reaching as, as they would like across the school. And so several of them have all shared, uh, sometimes anecdotally, but also some of our schools are actually doing it formally where they're taking groups of students and asking them those questions. I think, you know, you bring up a great point about uh, sharing, um, you know, what those questions are in a more formalized way. And I know uh, that work is already uh, being started because the principals themselves, the leaders, are asking themselves those questions as well. So I think that's something we'll continue to have dialogue about uh, to see, you know, the impact that that can have and, and what some of those um, good markers could be in which we're, we're gathering feedback. Mike? Yes, Susan? <laughs> I, did, I had two, uh, two quick questions, please. Okay, and I'm going to ask to do them quickly because we have one more presentation. Thank you. I will. Um, one, if we can please get just the breakdown of um, by schools, what we look like as far as the OSS is. And then secondly, uh, last year, you, I think you guys provided us with an idea of the OSS and any, re any repeat personnel that those numbers represented. So it would just be interesting to know if we're having um, additional success with sort of a reduction in repeat per students having OSSs. It would be, um, I'd appreciate that information as well. Susan, you'll get that soon. It's just since school just ended um, on Thursday, we didn't have the opportunity to pull the whole report, but it'll, you'll have it okay. for the next board meeting. Perfect. Thank you. And then I just want, before we close this out, because I know you're ready to close this out, I just want to acknowledge that we have Harley Jones, the CEO of 360 Youth Services here. And I just want to share our appreciation. You know, I'm a big fan of this particular program, but share the appreciation for um, your willingness to partner with us and to, you know, expand when we ask you to expand and never say, um, no to us yet, <laughs> so I'm hoping that you don't. But I think it's been a, a great program to bring this in for our kids. Um, I think they're getting some clinical services that they wouldn't have access to otherwise because you're right in our schools where they can get to you. So I appreciate that, and I just wanted to acknowledge that, that you're here. So thanks for your support. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. We have two pretty heavy <laughs> reports this board meeting. Now we go to equity. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I've got people coming. <laughs> I will say that's, our, our whole audience that is quite is a powerful up. team you got coming too. <laughs>
us, you're going to make sure we know who everybody is, right? I'm going to turn that over to a vet right now. Thank She's going to take care of that. Good evening. My name is Yvette Dubiel. I'm the Director of Educational Equity. Thank you for having us this evening so we can present and give you an update on the District Equity Leadership Team. Before we get started, we're going to go ahead and have everyone introduce themselves. guidance counselor over at Matia Valley. Uh, Mike Purcell, director of curriculum instruction for our high schools. Louis Lee. Sydney Polk, third grade teacher at Brooks Elementary. Adrian Morgan, principal of Young Elementary. Brandy Campbell, school counselor and equity coordinator from Wabonzi Valley High School. James Thornton, school counselor in Equal Valley. Here, reflect this year's work, but it is in no way an exhaustive list of all the things that have been accomplished this year. These are just some of those highlights. As we share any of that information, please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. We're gonna start off with just a little bit of refreshing history about the work that the District Equity Leadership Team has accomplished over the last five years. Back in 2014-15, we conducted a district-wide equity audit that was a year long and was both qualitative and quantitative. The results of those audits allowed us to reconvene the district equity leadership team known as DELT, and then we then implemented a district equity implementation plan that was systemic. 15-16, we then elaborated on the work of the DELT team by personalizing coach and mentoring support services to administrator that involved one-to-one -one interviews and looking at school improvement plans and offering a menu of options and tasks and activities that principals can adopt that were specifically equity related in their school improvement plan. We also then began to develop and facilitate professional learning sessions that was to be delivered to all staff. This is not exclusive to teachers. This is classified staff. These are bus drivers, custodians, um, even our, some of our vendoring staff, or staff in our vendors. Uh, but we then began meeting on a regular team, the district equity leadership team out on a regular basis to continue to monitor um, and look at the metrics that we have uh, associated with our implementation plan. At that time, 1516 was when we also began to explore uh, Equal Opportunity School. In the year 2016-17, we began to do almost a part two, if you will, of the equity audit where we conducted interviews of parents in district level equity groups and every principal conducted interviews with a handful of parents. We took that information and we connected that with the information that we had in our district ed equity lead leadership team to always consider how we could continually prove the work that we're doing. Also in 2016-17, uh, we conducted focus groups at each of our high school and each of our middle school with students. We took, and it was not all students, it was a group of students, and we took that information and we shared that with the, each of our administrators. It was also a time where we were out in the community more and sharing the work that we're doing regarding equity. Everything from um, PTA conversations, Naperville Indian community, to even some doctor's office that we're learning more about what equity and social justice is. This was also the time where we began to work very closely with our curriculum directors and our curriculum team to ensure that we have culturally responsive practices. And in 1718, it evolved more to personalized coaching for individual staff. This may involve a classroom visit. This may involve modeling what a culturally responsive lesson could look like. And this allowed us to monitor and enhance the equity implementation plan that we already have in place. What you'll hear is the highlights, again, of what we are doing for well, what we have accomplished this school year. But just as a reminder, the equity um, implementation plan has four major strands to it. Leadership, teaching and learning, professional development and growth, and family and community engagement. And under each of those strands, we have particular goals. Under leadership, for example, um, I won't go through all of them, but we did some such things as building capacity um, through dialogue with administrators because this is a never-ending 
go to understand equity paradigms, as well as recognizing the celebration and celebrating diversity. Teaching and learning was everything from um, those culturally responsive practices to working very closely with our curriculum groups. Professional learning is always a continuum when it comes to equity, and we've done things that are systemic, and we've done things that are very personalized based on the needs. And then family and community engagement is also a critical piece where we work collaboratively with different groups of parents as well as um, took a look at what we're already doing and decided what is working well and what can we improve on. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to members of the district equity leadership team to discuss the different highlights of what we've done based on the strand. So we'll start off with leadership. Hi, I'm Adrian Morgan, and I'm representing the leadership group today. Uh, we continue to work on our own professional development and focusing on how can we increase our knowledge on equity and how it's impacting our students and our families and how can we give them the support that they need. Uh, this, op this year we had the opportunity to send a group of administrators to uh, see Dr. Tyrone Howard. He was hosted by the DuPage ROE this past fall. Um, Dr. Howard really focuses on how schools can celebrate the diversity that is present within their buildings, how can um, educational leaders make sure that they're listening and hearing the concerns that are brought up by families, by students, by parents, and how can we partner with our families and with our students to make sure that we are giving them the knowledge, the information that they need in order to really access the educational programs and supports and services that we have in place. So we're really excited by the work and um, the information that he has shared with us, and we're looking forward to taking that because we really know that supports the work that we want to do within our district. Um, our plan moving forward is we've got a group of administrators who are going to the Model Schools Conference um, in June next week. And then he is coming, Dr. Howard is coming this fall uh, to work with our administrators over a period of a day. So we're really excited about how we're moving forward and how we're going to take what we learn and really implement it, continue to implement it within our buildings. Under the teaching and learning strand, um, as Yvette talked about our purposes under this strand, uh, Equal Opportunity Schools Initiative is just one of the many activities that has taken place uh, over the years under this strand. What we'd like to do for you is, is to walk through uh, some of the current year data um, and really present uh, for the first time some of the uh, counselors um, sort of testimonials to their work. Um, with Equal Opportunity Schools. Just as a reminder, um, Equal Opportunity Schools was part of the Lead Higher Initiative, which at the time there was a White House, the White House was having a national conversation about students of low income, uh, students of color, and the enrollment gap between those students and taking more rigorous courses. Lead Higher is just a partnership that exists between not only the College Board, but it's led by Equal Opportunity Schools. And they have a focus on closing the race and income gaps uh, that exist currently in AP and IB coursework. This slide right here just sort of gives a visual representation uh, to that gap. Um, as you look at it, um, you'll quite consistently see that um, that gap exists across students of color. and and in terms of their comparison to white and Asian American groups. We know that data shows us that students from all races and levels of income are 10 to 20 percent more likely to complete college if they have taken an AP course, regardless of whether or not the exam is taken. Just being in that atmosphere, being in the presence where they can push themselves, challenge themselves, experience failure in a supportive environment and respond to that um, that that increase 10 to 20 percent. We know that that increase percentage even uh, increases twofold to 26 to 34 percent if they actually um, take the AP exam than students who are not taking that. So uh, this chart um, represents really uh, the past uh, now upcoming fourth year of work. And I've done a lot of talking, so I'm going to let uh, Mr. Mike Purcell, who's our director of the high school core curriculum, sort of walk you through the data on this. I will. I promise not to walk you through each bar. Um, there is uh, obviously quite a bit of data in here 
And what you see as you go uh, from left to right in each one of those categories is a general trend of uh, moving up, which is which we are uh, really excited about. You'll hear more about why that's happening in just a few minutes because that is the work of the folks that are in the schools that, that are um, having those conversations and supporting our kids. Um, but what I really want to illustrate for you is, um, is in the area of uh, low income. And, and we have, we're really proud that in a high achieving district, and you see outside, you know, on the AP Honor Roll, and that's something that we, we've done more regularly than any school district around, we continue to uh, engage more kids. Um, this is the number of students engaged in AP coursework. 7% more of our students are engaged in that work than they were three years ago, and that's something to be celebrated. But really where we're making that change is for our students uh, in our low-income uh, categories, and that is across our, the racial groups, um, that what you see in each of our uh, different racial groups as they're broken out there, that um, those groups over the last three years have increased between, uh, between 75 and 80%, each of them, um, over that time, and that is what we're really seeing, and you'll hear the stories that are attached to that in just a minute, is that uh, students, what we really find is the role of Equal Opportunity Schools and our partnership with them is to give us more information about students and their passions so that we can help them to advocate for themselves in maybe the ways that they weren't before. And this data really uh, is evidence of that, and, and it's really a point of pride. So before we sort of transition here, I think Dr. Dubiel said it earlier, we know this is a lot of information, so please feel free at any time to interrupt us. Uh, we'd be more than happy to respond to any questions or comments. Every year we've tried to just sort of isolate a piece of this process, and it's a huge undertaking uh, of our partnership with the OS. And uh, this year we really want to talk to you, let speak to you uh, about the, our counselors and what their tremendous role has been and continues to be in making sure that not only are we finding these students, uh, but that they're actually putting, um, uh, I guess, keyboard to, to tab uh, and enrolling, and then also the support that uh, comes from keeping those students in the course. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn over first to Katie Kulak, who is one of the school counselors from Atiyah Valley High School. At Matia um, and all the high schools, EOS provides a survey which we administer to all students except for our PACE and instructional special education students. And that survey is given in the fall about late September to early October through the PE and health classes in the building. And the data from the survey, including the level of the area of interest of the type of courses that the students are interested in, course history, grades and attendance are used to identify the potential EOS students. An example of a student insight card, which is next, shows their reported learning mindset. Um, it also, on other parts of the card, have barriers and comments about themselves, the students self-report. The results are discussed among our internal EOS team at Matia Valley. The selected kids are assigned to a staff member on our EOS team, which consists of either their reported trusted adult, a counselor, or a staff member who has a connection with the student. We then meet individually with each student to discuss their survey, their interests, and enrollment. When I meet with students, we go over their survey. We talk about their successes. At that time, we call home to talk about the AP classes so the parent or guardian as well as the student are learning the same information at the same time. We also give them a letter to take home, congratulating on them on their accomplishments. Um, additionally, at that time, we talk about a summer bridge program that we offer that will be talked about later. But the teachers who teach that summer bridge program for the AP kids in our building, um, we hand schedule those kids into those same teachers' classes for the upcoming school year so they maintain that connection um, with them for the remain remainder of the school year. Next, we'll hear from Brandy Campbell, uh, school counselor, uh, 504 court everything. <laughs> Equity you know, coordinator. <laughs> uh, yeah, all of her titles uh, from Wabonzi Valley High School. Thank you. Um, in January at Wabonzi, we hold an EOS AP Enrollment Day. 
Students are selected to attend this event based on the outreach list that we receive from EOS. It uses information from the fall EOS student and staff surveys. The list identifies students that are potentially ready to take their first AP class based on GPA, teacher recommendations, and student growth mindsets. Counselors and the EOS team review the out outreach list and remove students we believe are not quite ready for an AP class at this time based on study habits, school attendance, or social emotional concerns. The photo in the up upper left hand corner is an example of a note of encouragement each student receives from a staff member they have a relationship with. Staff members select the students that they would like to write a note to and hand deliver those cards in the days leading up to our EOS AP enrollment day. The purpose of the card is to encourage the students to challenge themselves academically and to consider enrolling in an AP class. Students are sent an invitation inviting them to meet with the principal counseling team to learn more about our AP courses. Students are sent passes to attend the event during their PE class. They arrive, are greeted in, sign in, and of course snacks are provided. They are also given AP courses that are available at Wabanzi and the supports and resources that we have for them. This year we had an 85% participation rate. 186 students were invited to this event and 158 attended. Students that were not able to attend later met one-on-one -on -one with their counselors. We begin the meeting by showing a video of prior EOS students who have taken their first AP um, class and they share their experiences. You'll see a clip of this video later in our presentation. As pictured on the top right, Principal Stipp, Ryan Van Camp, and our Director of Guidance and I share a presentation with the students about the benefits of taking an AP class. For example, we highlight um, college curriculum at a slower place, pace with high school supports, the opportunity to earn college credit, increased graduation rates in four years, and college admissions counselors viewing AP courses very favorably. Counselors are in a U shape, which you can see in the bottom picture um, around the back of the room. After the meeting, the presentation is done, counselors meet one-on-one -on -one with the students in their caseload to enroll them in their fall courses immediately. Of the 186 students that we invited, 118 of them enrolled in their first AP class. That was the 63% um, enrollment rate. Most of the students that did not enroll in an AP class did enroll in dual credit or TCD. We have found that this event um, fosters positive peer influence and contrib cont contributes, excuse me, to the success of the event. After these students enroll in their AP class, we tell them that they will be invited in September to a first time AP student uh, celebration. This event is for all first time AP students that are juniors and seniors, not just our EOS students. The event is intended to offer support, resources, encouragement, and community around the time that our EOS survey shows that students begin to think about dropping their AP class. It lets students see and know that they are not alone and to learn study tips and resources from each other. The feedback from our first time EOS AP students has been overwhelmingly positive. One of my favorite quotes from our spring EOS post survey is, I push myself to the limit, challenge myself in ways I had never done before, and I'm very proud of myself. Wabonzi Valley underrepresented student. Finally, to discuss the process of maintaining, uh, Mr. James Storton from Nequa Valley High School, school counselor. Let's see if I can balance this on You're my knee. No, I think we're good. Um, at Nequa Valley, as is true throughout the district, uh, genuine engagement with our students is very, is very high on our priority list. As counselors, we are committed to making sure that each student understands their journey is not a solo expedition, but a joint collaboration that includes their parents, their teachers, and their, and their counselor. As with all students, we communicate that support is available from the start of their AP journey until the very last exam has been taken. 
in order to maintain a consistent connection with our students while providing the support each student needs to be successful, one of the main tools used is our weekly progress report. Each week a report of students with D's and F's is produced and delivered to each counselor electronically. Counselors review the report as part of a regular procedure to identify, identify students in need of additional supports. We may not jump immediately if we see a low grade, understanding that a bad exam day can create a speed bump along the academic road. But if a student appears a second week in a row, we will send a pass and sometimes send an email to that student. We want to make sure that the student has an active plan in place to bring the grade up or help them put a plan into effect while also helping them to understand all of the support options available to them. Most students know that they can access a teacher through our academic resource centers in each subject area. But the one thing we have done uh, for our new to AP students at Nequa Valley is hand schedule their stu those students so their lunch coincides with the AP teacher's supervision period. If a student has elected to take multiple AP courses, we try to match the student with the teacher of the more complex class for that student. For example, if a strong math student has chosen to take AP U.S. History as well as AP Calculus AB, we'll try to schedule the student with the AP U.S. History uh, teacher supervision period, if, if at all possible. Uh, we feel that direct contact with their own teacher provides a level of security for the student to endure the rigor of the class as well as the initial shock and lack of success that may be experienced at the very beginning of their AP journey. We also work with students and teachers to put together plans that help the student overcome the potential need to want to drop the course as those feelings are reality for some students. Whether scheduling specific before and or after school sessions with the AP teacher while also adding additional check-ins from the counselor, we try to support the student's needs so their experience, although challenging, is a worthwhile experience that may lead the student to continuing to take a additional AP courses the following year. Uh, with her permission, I was able to add a clip of one of my uh, recent graduates, Ms. Reagan Young. Uh, she finished with a 3.41 grade point average, but as you can see from her, com her comments, uh, taking an AP course as a senior provided the preparation she felt she needed before moving on to post-secondary education. Uh, of course, as with most students, the realization didn't occur until the end of her journey, but she did realize that this year's experience was a benefit and not a liability. She was a consistent student throughout her NEQA journey, but admitted she was comfortable with our college prep curriculum as she felt it was rigorous enough. Uh, when we met to discuss adding an AP course to her schedule, there was some discomfort and some pushback because of the amount of work she expected to receive. She had taken AP Human Geography as a sophomore, so she had an idea of what to expect. And although she enjoys social studies, she was unsure of trying to take a class like AP Government and Politics as a senior and spent 15 minutes trying to politic her way out of the class. <laughs> she just felt trying to balance the AP class and be a member of the school's soccer team would be too much, especially during the second semester of her senior year when soccer the AP exam, and senioritis all collide. I was pleased that Reagan trusted me enough to share her concerns, and although I did understand her reasoning, I asked that she continue to trust the process as well as, her, as well as her own abilities. Being able to be transparent with her, letting her know that I would, be, I would complete the journey with her and that I believed she was more than capable of finishing what she started may not have been the response she was looking for, because she really did want to drop the class uh, at the semester when she had accrued the, the graduation requirement for government. Uh, but I was happy to see that uh, as I proctored the AP government exam, she was one of two or three students of color seeing her AP journey through to fruition. And to conclude our section, I just wanted to uh, let the board know of some ongoing supports that we have uh, for students. Uh, that in, through uh, through this initiative and um, this summer starting in a few weeks at each of our sites we'll have the AP Summer Bridge Katie talked about a little bit really available to all junior senior first time AP takers uh, whether they're identified through the US process or self-identified or through their parents or a counselor or teacher 
Um, really just to say, hey, you're kind of taking on a new challenge and let's help you to smooth that path. And uh, we staff that with, uh, with our AP teachers and, and, then, um, and then really do some things about belongingness and um, some of those things about the bumpy path that, uh, that James was just talking about and just getting folks ready for those, uh, for those conversations. We also, during the summertime, we'll have a handful of our teachers that are uh, teaching those classes either for the first time or um, have been doing it for a while. Um, engaged in some summer learning activities to sharpen their saw and to share their best practices with other folks and, and learn from them as well, um, both on the, um, on the content but also the instructional side that comes out of those institutes. Something we're really excited about for next year is the, those insight cards that you've seen. You've seen those before. Um, we have worked with our technology team in order to integrate those into our school information system. So those can be on demand. Uh, for our teachers and our counselors to see anytime they're having a conversation or they, they want to think about uh, sort of all of that information that is involved in that insight card, which is just different from other uh, information that we would have in the SIS. And also uh, along the lines of some things that Katie and James are talking about, just some things that our, our teams are doing with strategic scheduling in terms of lining their prep periods up with lunch periods and um, uh, finding ways to really be flexible and, and deliberate in terms of how we're scheduling our teachers and our kids in, into spaces at the same time and using our uh, student academic guidance time um, in each of the schools to, to leverage that time as well. So those things are just ongoing supports that we have for, for all kids, uh, but really being intentional with our kids that are taking on this challenge for the first time. As Brandy mentioned, we'd like to just show a very short clip of uh, just some of our student voices and testimonials of their own experience in taking an AP course. I would say the best part for me was like the challenge because that way I can be more responsible and like I could actually see if I go home and actually do what I'm supposed to do. So I would definitely say the challenges of it. Um, throughout the year I really enjoyed just meeting new people and seeing like the different faces that I probably wouldn't have been in the same classes if I wouldn't have taken the AP class. It gives you a different hindsight, kind of like a different way of looking at the education world, if you think about it, because, you know, you go to high school and it's not as challenging as you think it would be. But once you're put in the AP class, it's a whole different environment. You're more independent with all your studies and your work. Probably the workload, I think. Um, I know this year at AP English 3, we, we do a lot of writing. So, I mean, rewrites sometimes are, can be a little um, inconvenient uh, if you have like other things going on in your schedule. Um, having to incorporate that into uh, your uh, things you do after school, I think. I thought that it was like for really smart people that were always in advanced classes and that have taken honors classes in the past. But um, once I actually, since I took it, I found that there was a variety of people that they're maybe not the best at one subject, but um, AP and this AP class is um, for everyone. As long as you put your mind to it, you'll do it, whether you took an honors class in the past or an AP class in the past. That you have to be super smart to be in these classes, and that if you're not a A, B student, or even if you have a C in a class, or you usually get Cs on the regular, that you're not fit for an AP class, which is the complete opposite because there's kids in AP classes from all different types of backgrounds, different types of learning ways, and they have different ways of learning, and they're all in AP classes because they know that they have it in them to whatever it takes to do it, they'll do it. I, I expect them to be ridiculously difficult um, um, in regards to like the material, which I think is uh, probably not true as long as you're, you know, Putting in the work, putting in the time, and uh, making sure you understand the material and asking questions and really staying engaged, I think it's, it's not bad at all, really. I would recommend it. It's a pretty fun class. It's, it's not like, I can't speak for the other AP classes, but AP Psychology is a pretty, um, it's a pretty chill class if you do what you're supposed to do. Yeah, I, I would, just because it's like a really fun class, and I know it's challenging, but it's always good to see you like, do good in an AP class because then you're like, wow, it was hard, but I'm doing it. I'm becoming more responsible with it and I'm succeeding at it. 
Oh, yeah, most definitely. I think uh, it'd be very beneficial. Um, like I said earlier, to keep, probably keep you engaged more, um, a little more fun, I think, um, if, you, if you're interested in that subject. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because it's really fun and you get to meet new people. I do because I could have had more experience. I sometimes do just because uh, I would have liked more experience with it just because it is a college kind of course and it is um, an environment like it, like that because the teacher may not be um, super individual to you. She won't come to you and ask you for help. Um, if you need any help or anything, it's not very personal, but you can always approach her at the end of class, the beginning of class. Kind of, but at the same time, I was properly placed at the right time, if you ask me. Um, freshman year, I was new to everything new, so it was different. You know, just getting used to high school itself, and I couldn't imagine being bombarded with a college level push, and I'm still at that time, like five years away from college, so. But as sophomore year, I would definitely recommend trying it, just one, and then keep going if you like it, if you think it's good enough. Yeah, probably, maybe sophomore year. I think taking it junior year was like, good. Yeah, I would have liked to take some others so that I could have seen how I would have progressed at the end of my uh, high school years. I think it's more beneficial, really, especially like preparing you for college, and uh, it's an easier transition, I think, um, going up to college and getting ready for that. All right, we'll transition over to professional development and growth. I'd like to report out on the professional development and growth. Um, first of all, we, we are so thankful to the school board for approving our uh, guest teacher academy. Um, I'm pleased to report that we have over 300 uh, guest teachers who are uh, signed up for our two um, sessions that we're holding this summer. Um, additionally, we have secured our fall and spring dates. Um, the district's uh, team has created a, a fantastic day of learning for our, for our guest teachers, um, and, and that professional development will be provided by teachers at all grade levels um, in order to be able to provide those different perspectives to those guest teachers. Um, you know, our plan is to provide capacity for our guest teachers uh, with regards to equity and culture. Um, basic, you know, guest teacher 101 information, what you know, what you can expect when you walk into the classroom, um, what teaching and learning looks like now, um, as well as safety, and then finally technology. I also wanted to report out on, uh, and Dr. Dubiel kind of spoke to this um, starting in uh, the year 1516 with regards to um, her professional development opportunities that she provides to um, staff members as well as community members. Um, she's developed um, over 15 different professional learning op options um, that are customizable. Um, and she's just been an amazing resource coming into our buildings during SIP days, uh, during uh, staff meetings, uh, being able to provide um, professional development on practical applications to address bias, cultural responsive practices, cultural norms and affinity groups, equity leaders, uh, literacy, and content plus cultural responsiveness. So hi, um, I'm Sydney Polk, third grade teacher at Brooks Elementary. And as a part of the professional development, three elementary schools um, requested cultural norms of an affinity group, specifically with African American students. Um, I was able to present on the African American black experience as not only a teacher, but a parent in this district. And the purpose of this PD was to discuss ways to validate identities and be allies in the work, explore the critical importance of relationships for black African American students, and to share practical considerations to meaningful ways to meaningfully interact with students. Um, having the opportunity to present to teachers was positive and I felt like it was very well received. Um, it proved that our teachers have the desire to learn more about how to better understand and connect with our African American students. Um, in that PD, we were able to discuss our personal past experiences with race and how it impacts who we are today and how we see the world. Um, our presentation allowed us to discuss topics such as teaching urban students in suburban environments and ways to counter uh, negative imagery and um, perceptions. It also provided teachers the opportunity to, to discuss scenarios that can happen in the classroom and how they would respond. And the race can be a, an extremely sensitive topic. 
uh, these conversations are needed to help meet the needs of our students of color. Um, I, along with another parent in our district, were more than happy to be a resource to discuss the importance of appreciating our young black students for who they are, building a trust and rapport with students and their parents, as well as addressing the social emotional needs of our African American students. Um, we provide an environment where it was safe to ask those uncomfortable questions. Um, and a lot of times after the <laughs> professional development, um, teachers kind of came to us privately and said, hey, you know what, I had this situation and I didn't know how to address it and what do I say and what do I do? Um, so it was very powerful in that sense. Um, and they just had several questions about just addressing race and equity in the classroom. Um, specifically with their African-American students. So I'm grateful for the opportunity, um, and I hope that in some way or form we can continue this in the future. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Mike Dutut, and I'll be uh, sharing out a highlight of the family and community engagement strand, um, which I'm part of. Um, initially, we started out with looking for ways to engage the community in parents. Um, what we did last um, June is we sent a list out to all the principals to see what were different things that they were using that were um, their efforts to engage parents. And so we collected some of those with the goal of eventually creating a uh, warehouse where we can share different ideas. Um, and each principal also listed their multicultural uh, community celebrations that are held within their school. And so once we got all those results, we were able to look at that. Um, and we combed through a little bit deeper to look for specific things that were um, explicitly focused on equity-driven efforts. Um, so we went back to the drawing board with our, um, our General Assembly, and we created a list of different things that were very, very specific to that equity piece. Um, our work began uh, kind of on a primitive level, um, but that actually ended up working out really well, where we could look at the different types of uh, family engagement and what each response was. Um, they're color-coded so you can see if it was elementary, middle school, or high school, and the schools then located or listed their name on there so you could see what school it was. So what we did is we broke those down into um, different categories. Um, so eventually we'll be able to look and say, if we're looking for a tier two, um, intervention or you know parenting activity we can look specifically there we know the school who created it and we can use that as a resource in our school um, so initially we started out to explore different um, ways to engage our parents and there's a lot of it that goes on within our district and this is an easy way for us to share that um, we broke it down into um, we kind of used a tiered approach to it so tier one is just universal so that is something that goes out to everybody so if you think about newsletters that go out to parents parent um, opportunities for that parent education piece that would be a tier one um, we looked at tier two where that could be more specific so if you were to look at general population would get parent education a specific niche within that group could be our project or our gifted students that would be a tier two intervention um, and then looking at um, the third tier which is very very specific that could be a project arrow or gifted learner um, specific to african-american or hispanic population. Um, so we broke um, it down for every one of the different types of parent engagement um, and that will create a database for schools to use if they're looking for um, specific um, family engagement practices that are um, specific towards <coughs> So as far as future work, not only are we going to continue this, all the systemic pieces of the equity plan, and just a reminder, you only received a glimpse of what we've worked on um, for this school year, but we're gonna continue that systemic lens as well as that personalized lens, so providing in-depth support to our staff and our students. Our staff could be that personalized PD, that conversation, and then of course, as um, some of my colleagues here shared, um, having conversations with students as well, so they know that um, we're always trying to move that equity needle forward. Questions? Ms. Grover, want to start? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was thinking about the EOS. I think it's a great program. Sometimes it's difficult as a student to think like the kids were talking to go from, you know, middle school regular classes, suddenly you take an AP co course. It just seems so far-fetched, the thought. Instead of doing a survey in ninth grade, have you considered doing a survey in eighth grade? 
Um, that way you can inform the parents during that transition period, hey, we're thinking about your kid joining AP and they can kind of get the ball rolling, maybe take an honors course freshman year so that the jump doesn't seem as drastic. I'm smiling because, and Dr. Sullivan will remember this, three years ago at our onboarding meeting with the OS, you know, we asked them to save us from ourselves. And I think within 10 minutes of meeting with them, that was our question to them. Uh, do they have an instrument where we could start surveying our, our students right away in middle school? And, you know, one of the things that they told us was obviously, you know, EOS continues to right now have a focus on the high school level. Uh, they have heard from a number of districts about expanding that reach, and I know they are investigating that. But I will tell you some of the activities that we have done within the own, our own district is, one, first um, present to all levels about what EOS is, what it's about. Uh, that was done at one of our General Assemblies meetings um, a, over a year ago with all of our principals. And really the whole focus was what you just said in your question really was how do we start preparing our students even more so to know that, you know, once they're um, getting to the high school level, but even at the middle and elementary level, you know, pushing them, they're capable uh, and to prepare them for those challenges. And I think, uh, you know, having those um, conversations uh, with the leaders in each one of those buildings has helped to push that type of conversation forward. Uh, you know, will EOS develop something like that in the future? I think so, because they, have, they are continually hearing that from our partner districts who are also in EOS and to, to take a look at that. But again, we know that the, the biggest, uh, you know, continued uh, piece for success will be the environment that's created for students. Uh, and that begins with the teacher in the classroom, pushing them and excelling them, uh, and, and also our counselors. So I hope, I know, I don't want to say no, but I know we're, we're, we're pushing EOS. We're, we're looking at our own um, also, um, you know, indicators and in, in what we might be, be able to come up with as well. One more quick question. Does EOS um, work with the P3 organizations in the high school levels? and discuss it with them or do you attend their meetings tell them yeah great them? question i know um there's a as you know mr purcell showed you two slides of data we probably could do a whole another presentation on the amount of data that we actually get from eos and some of that data is sort of teased out and shared out by the individual principals um, i know they're sharing that not just with um you know the counselors but the entire staff walks through that data, they walk through their own survey data, uh, also data of the students that are in there, and I know that's presented to parent groups as well. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, is presented to some of the parents, but I know our parents are well aware, not only of EOS, but some of the, the work that's done with them. And then, of course, on nights like this, uh, we know that our parents are, are very interested in, in some of the things that we're doing. I do have a couple comments. <laughs> well, I, I do have a so comments are quicker than questions, actually. I need to pick myself up off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, just first of all, to all of you, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I mean, the work you've done, the time you've put into this. Um, some of the administration will remember when we, when we started putting in DLT and, and EOS, while I was a firm believer in the concept, um, I thought it was a little conceptual and didn't have a lot of background behind it. And, and three years later, I'm, I'm proud to say I'm extremely impressed with all the work you guys have done. Um, I'm glad that you first and foremost identified the low income students. Um, I was as well a low income, income student and that is, one of the biggest factors of, of student failure over over race or anything else. That's the, the biggest impact. So the fact that we're trying to target some of our low income students and, and kind of lift them up, um, it, it's great to see. And, and the numbers, the trending is awesome. Um, I was very concerned and spoke out numerous times about the supports around EOS uh, because my biggest thing was is that if, if we, if we don't set up the supports, we're gonna set them up for failure. And, and to see what you guys have done is awesome. Um, you know, and, and not only that, but 
you know, our wonderful counselor from, from NEQA um, mentioned a few of these things is that you know not only are we giving them the supports but we're t teaching these students an invaluable skill which is how to set a plan for themselves and how to advocate for themselves and how to take responsibility you know that was the greatest gift that I gave my daughter before she went to college because yes that rigor is important don't get me wrong but to teach them those other skills as far as advocating and setting a plan and take responsibility and which leads me to the last thing is um, you know I, I, I I've been to a couple eighth grade parents nights you know where they where the principal comes in from the high school and, and talks to the the incoming freshmen and 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 all of our principals do a wonderful job of talking about you know going out and trying those honors or that AP course uh, and I think what Lewis touched on and this is what EOS touched on when they first came and talked to us and how taking an honors or AP course increases their likelihood um, should they go to college 20% uh, or more um, because of that rigor uh, I, I want to make sure we stay focused on that because I, I think too often we might lose focus of that and we try to sell the parents on oh you're gonna get cr college and credit well that has dwindled more and more and more every single year as far as that credit that you get going to college so let's start talking about how we're gonna prepare our students um, for college uh, and that is through those AP and honors and through that rigor so thank you again that's all I have to say thanks Mark Susan First, thank you so much. Um, amazing information, everything. Um, just extremely impressed. Thank you so much for not only hearing from the administration, but hearing from the school leadership and, and school uh, teaching staff that's involved. Extremely helpful. Just a quick couple of comments. Thank you so much for opening the AP Summer Bridge to all students who are first time AP students. I think that is so critical and so important not to leave anyone out because many students will be trying it um, and, and I think it, it helps ease both the students and the parents um, into the process. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Please continue with the ongoing support extremely. Um, I think it really helps ease parents and students knowing that you guys have really um, given lots of thought and realization to the fact that this is not easy, it's challenging, but we're right there beside you and we're trying to provide as much <clears throat> additional uh, resources for you to be successful because it's very um, evident that the goal behind this is that staff leadership, that we all want our students to be successful. And um, then the final thing, oh my gosh. Um, Mark, it's split, I mean, I'm sorry. Mike, it slipped my mind. If, I, if it comes back, I'll come I'll back, come back to you one last time, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ms. Peel. Um, well, I, I've been reading this book called um, Late Bloomers. I don't know if anybody's looked at that lately, but it um, has made me, I keep thinking about it as you guys have been making this presentation because it talks about the you know later development of our brains and you know until almost 26 um, and that sometimes kids just need that much time before they're going to be engaged in life and and their career and their success whatever um, but it seems like middle school is the time when a lot of them go away <laughs> and it takes and they don't come back out of it until after they graduated from high school. Um, so I'm wondering about, it, it seems like the AP is an awesome program and you can see it and I can think if, boy, I wonder if somebody had ever told me to do that in high school, would that have changed my, my projection in life? But um, besides that, what is there to like get the, a student engaged? What and what and I know it has to be sometimes measurable and the AP is just this beautiful way of measuring something but are there other things that we're looking at and, and especially I'm thinking like Natasha um, the middle school level that we can say hey this is a kid who needs to be more involved in this 
I would say um, in the beginning of the year, we, with our eighth graders, we start out with a career unit um, in which we've had uh, a lot of people that have come in and created a really good program to get kids to start thinking about what do you want your future career to be and what do you need to be able to get there. And so that starts out pretty early in the year. Um, we start talking about recommendations, believe it or not, it was actually in one of our promotional speeches by one of our students on that very first day about um, what is um, that course recommendation process going to look like for that following year. What I've seen is um, a change, I think, in I think what we would typically look at maybe five years ago where kids met a certain mark in order to be into that, um, you know, put into those honors classes. So you'll have kids that might not meet that on paper, but we know that it's still within them. And so you'll see a lot of kids that um, are shocked when our teachers are talking them, you know, to them during advisory saying, you know, I think we need to see this, this and that, and then we'll put you into that honors course. And a lot of them are really surprised that there is a student that would be recommended for it. Um, what's kind of cool is once you see, you know, a couple years down the road, the kids that actually did that are like, well, I was scared at first, but it wasn't that bad. And it really does set those kids up, I think, for, um, you know, those AP classes in their junior and senior year. I think our way of going about it has been very different. It's a more personalized approach um, to getting to know that specific kid and that strength. And while it might not be, you know, all honors courses, it could be one. And a lot of the kids that, you know, our eighth grade students work with are kids that may not have thought that that was some potential that they had had. But it, mm -hmm. regardless, it was still within those kids. And I think our eighth grade teachers do a good job of pulling that out. I just quickly add to that through the initiative, the world of work under Kathy mm -hmm. P's leadership okay. that's happening. Those students are having those conversations right now about what their future careers are going to be. And naturally that rolls right into what Mike was saying. Well, how do you get there? What are some of the coursework and how to prepare yourself for the rigor of that career that you're, you're or work that you're thinking about taking on? So I think it's going to be continue to become more systemic right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember the world of work, so that's awesome. I guess I was looking at, too, um, like outside of academics, you know, how do we hook them? But it, sometimes it's not the academics that gets a kid hooked. It's music, it's arts, it's whatever. Um, so I'm just wondering about those kind of things. But anyway, but I, I do appreciate This is, like, so much. And we have the other addition to the, what you guys are doing and still doing and working on and coming out. So um, yeah, we know this is just a glimpse. <laughs> Mike, I remembered what I needed, what I wanted to say. <laughs> okay, Susan. The, the, stu the thank you so much. The student, um, the student testimonials are so important. Definitely consider as you are approaching the parents and sharing with the parents, sharing with the students as they're moving, you know, from eighth to ninth grade or ninth to tenth, the AP recruitment day, please consider, and you may be doing this, but please consider having students there sharing some of the video that you shared with us with the student comments, because I think that speaks volumes for potential students and parents to hear from students who may have been sitting and thinking exactly what they're thinking at that moment and how they, um, you know, appreciate and are so pleased that they tried something that was challenging for them. A uh, couple comments, a couple questions. First of all, thank you, Yvette, for your service to District 204. Um, we're going to miss you as you go to the Regional Office of Education. Uh, you've truly made a difference. To this whole team, you guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. I wish I could be, I want to be part of this team. I'm giving them a star in their head. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing, you guys are doing great work. And what was good about this presentation is that you gave us tangible, real life, action not just like yeah, yeah 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 this was like real stuff so i really appreciate it and i encourage you to push the system i like you know i'm hearing that a mom and a teacher is teaching our students and telling them the real story we need to be pushed we need the real story. 
So thanks for doing that. If you need permission, I'm the board president. I don't know if I have any power whatsoever. One I don't, seventh power, yeah. <laughs> I have like zero. <laughs> But nevertheless, I give you permission to push the system. It's important that we do that. That's how we get better. So thank you for all that. Uh, Yvette was right. It's a glimpse. There's an implementation plan that's like six pages long. Thank you for having something yeah. down on paper. There's a lot of work to be done. There's some ongoing stuff that's going on. But equity work is a process and it is ongoing so thanks for all that my two questions is number one how are we doing with our elementary kids and middle school kids in project there i know it's not eos but it's project arrow and accelerated math back in the dinosaur days when i was practicing we were much over reliant on a test and that excluded many kids. So what are we doing better, I hope, to allow more kids to participate in these higher level classes at the elementary and middle school level? Well, I guess I can kind of answer that. <laughs> um, well, still now, they do still have to test in, and um, it, it is, we're pretty strict about, you know, the cutoff to, to get in at, at this point. Um, I do agree with you, just um, kind of when we're talking about kids um, wanting to do AP later, um, some of that confidence comes from when they're little. We know that, right? Um, and being able to build that confidence early is important so that when they do get to middle school, AP doesn't seem so far-fetched. Um, so right now, um, I think there's work to be done in that area as far as, you know, um, we're really relying on test scores right now for them to qualify to get in. Um, but that's definitely an area that, you know, we can improve on in that point to be more, um, to allow more students the opportunity um, to participate in both accelerated math and to Project Arrow. Yeah, I hope we no. learn from our EOS loss. I was just going to make a comment. Um, I do know that as a principal group that we're having conversation. I think different schools are in different places. Um, I, I definitely know that in my building, we don't just strictly look at the test scores. We really do encourage the teachers to um, look at kids who may not fit based upon the test scores, but they're seeing from their academics and the way that they're performing in class, maybe this is a student that we should give an opportunity to, to participate in math yeah. acceleration or to participate in Project Arrow. Um, I know in my building, I know in other, several other buildings in the district, our Project Arrow teacher also um, pushes into the classroom and does enrichment class-wide mm -hmm. or she pulls kids and she gets through in the entire class by working with them in small groups and looking at how the kids are performing and um, exposing them to higher level thinking and higher level activities and having an extra set of eyes help us also identify kids that, hey, this is someone else we need to think about or another student that we need to look at. So, I mean, of course, more work needs to be done, but definitely we have buildings that are pushing the envelope a little bit and giving kids the opportunity to try out Project Arrow or try out math acceleration and making sure that we're giving them the supports that they need as it, well. And just to Mike's point, and just because you and I, Ms. Morgan, have had this conversation at the table about exactly this, um, I still think, and to Mike's point, I think we need to learn from EOS because I have been in that situation where my kid has been a borderline and we haven't taken that chance. And I think when you have the parents there, when you have the teacher there that's advocating for the student, we can't just rely on that test and we have to take more chances. You know, and at that point, again, it's up to the supports and it's up to, it's up to the, the, the student advocating for themselves. So, uh, you know, I, I hope we grow in that area because I think there's still work to be done. But, and I, but, if I can say, I think in, in my building, the same thing's kind of happening. Teachers do have a voice for students who don't necessarily qualify, but I do think turning towards 
um, empowering teachers in the classroom to reach the needs of some of those students as well. Um, so it's not always, you know, if you don't make it in Project Arrow or if you don't make it in Accelerated Math, like what can we do in the classroom to challenge those students um, when they're with us as well and kind of changing the idea of, of that and how we address those needs of our students who are learning at a faster place, pace but may not qualify for Project Arrow, can they still get some challenge, you know, within the classroom? as well so um, you know we have th things in place with enrichment and you know teachers can advocate um, obviously but still some work to do in that and we're seeing some success stories at the high school from students who have never been in Project Arrow right. and I know those conversations continue to happen I know you know at the middle school level I don't know if you guys want to share that some of the factors that you're looking at that aren't just test scores but that are, are also good indicators of success in some of those students who are actually enrolled in Project Arrow through that advocacy? Yeah, I would say the, um, the tests and the numbers are kind of a, a guide for making that decision, but I think getting to know that specific student and where their strengths are and what they're going to be able to do. Um, typically, enrollment, I think, in our classes for Project Arrow, even accelerated math, once the kids test in, it's not typically a lot that um, that test and, and go to that next level. Historically, at, at my middle school, it has not been. So we've looked at um, those specific kids, pushing them, even teaching the kids, like, well, here's a process for it. Here's where you take that test. Um, our data this year, our, you know, our, our math scores this year, we had more kids that qualified for accelerated math, for creative math, than we have ever had. Um, and those are typically kids that may not have initially signed up or known that there was a process for that. So we had our highest amount this year, which was pretty great. And even with that, those are kids that, that would qualify for that. But um, throughout the school year, you may get a kid that um, has that potential with them that might struggle um, or be challenged at that higher level. And I think giving that kid that opportunity, regardless of scores, because we know that potential is within the kid, I think is really important. And I think you know the numbers are an important guide for us, but it's not a gate that would keep that kid from having that opportunity to take that higher level class if that was something that the teacher or the team thought was a good fit to challenge a kid. One challenge we've faced at the high school level is that there's this perception of students that since I wasn't PA, I'm not AP. Mm -hmm. right. We hear that from students all the time. Yeah. And so we're trying to break that myth that the two actually don't have anything to do with each other. Just because you were PA in elementary and middle school doesn't mean you're automatically AP or doesn't mean you weren't, you're excluded from it. Um, so we, we are constantly trying to kind of reprogram that thinking, but it's definitely a challenge and a barrier we're seeing at the high school level. And that, and that is one of the pieces that we are incorporating in the middle school level is when we're having those conversations with parents who are, you know, well, you know why, didn't, why didn't my child make, you know, PA? Well, uh, your child didn't make PA, however, that doesn't mean that they're not going to qualify for AP. So right. we are trying to, to break that down that barrier as well. Um, and then just to kind of expand even further, um, differentiation, differentiation, differentiation for the higher students, for the middle students, as well as for the lower students. One last question. We did an equity audit in 2014-15. Um, it appears we did a mini audit. I know your first year, that's what you did all year. <laughs> and it, it's quite an undertaking. But when do we go back to this and look at the data that we collected in two, four, 2014 and then do some kind of comparison data where we're at now? Yeah. I think there's definitely opportunities to revisit that equity audit and then consider what we can do better. It's always a continuous process. So we've had conversations about what that could look like and um, whoever replaced me and how I can still support um, the district um, since it is in DuPage County um, to do that so that it continues and we continue that important work. Any other further questions? Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your summer. Yes, <laughs> you're dismissed. <laughs>
our board norms. Um, we looked at our board evaluation sheet. What else did we look at? Uh, board goals. And so we're still, I'm still seeking input. You have until this Friday to get back to me in terms of any input in regards to the work that we did in order that we can finalize it and get it out to the public. I think that's all I have. Um, do I have a motion, motion to, to adjourn? Do I second. Have a, oh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye.